Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. We're going to show much love to the rhythm section today with John Avila, who's uh, most well known for being the bass player from Oingo Boingo, but he's had a storied career as a producer and an engineer after that. I mean, he's he's worked on hundreds of records, literally. Uh, I want to thank our, our friend, our mutual friend, Joby Ford from Mariachi El Bronx, the Bronx, the Drips, uh, for hooking us up. Uh, let, me, let me give you uh, another super talented guy, a, a thumbnail sketch of John's background. Been in the music business for over 40 years, well-respected bassist, producer, composer, arranger, recording and mixing engineer, as I said, session musician and vocalist. As a bassist, he played with Oingo Boingo for 11 years. Uh, and for, if you don't, I, I think most people probably listening to this do know Oingo Boingo. If you don't, for most of the 80s, they were to L.A. and Orange County kind of like what the Grateful Dead was to San Francisco. They had, they put on three and a half hour, four hour I shows. I got a Grateful Dead story. Don't miss. All right, cool. Uh, and they were, they, their music was very high energy. Their shows are very high energy. So if you haven't heard them, check them out. You'll, I mean, it's still relevant, very relevant today. Uh, as a sideman, John's tour to recorded with Neil Young, Willie Nelson, Steven Tyler, Richie Havens, Stuart Copeland, Nels Klein, who we had here on the show, Bob Weir, Mickey Hart, and Bill Kreutzman from the Dead, Steve Vai, we had here, Eric Johnson, and dozens of other artists. He's performed on major motion picture soundtracks, national commercials, and major network television shows. And he's also composed tracks for TV commercials and movies. Uh, when John was in Oingo Boingo, he co-produced the band along with Danny Elfman. Again, since that point, he's produced hundreds of other records. Since 2003, He's also taught a number of different subjects, including performance, production, mixing, arranging, and composing at a variety of schools. And he's been an instructor at the L.A. Music Academy since 2009. No, yeah, L.A. Uh, Los Angeles College of Music. Yeah. It's formerly known as L.A. Music Academy, but that's all good. Los Angeles College of Music. I just realized that that came out of my mouth. I was like, that's not what you just said. Sorry about that. Uh, awesome. Thank you, man. You, want, you can tell you great. Well, thank you story. for all that. Yeah, great. Hello, everyone. Right, right on, man. Thank you, Craig, for having me on your show. And My and, pleasure. Uh, thank you, Joby. Yeah, <laughs> man. Joby Ford. Uh, tell me your Grateful Dead story before we get started. Uh, well, uh, and this is coming from Danny Elfman. Okay. Danny, Danny uh, hooked up with, with Jerry Garcia one year. Wow. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what year it was, but it turns out Jerry was a fan. This is according to Danny that, that Jerry was a fan of, the, of Oingo Boingo. And the two of them got together. Uh, according to Danny, he and his daughter went over to Jerry's place in the Bay Area and, and spent a weekend hanging out. And, and uh, they ended up deciding to, to do a, a show together. And uh, apparently the show was going to be at the Rose Bowl. And, uh, and we, I mean, it was going to be the dead and the and Oingo Boingo. And uh, uh, I remember it got to the point where they said, oh, this is the date. I actually had the date in my calendar. And I was so excited. And, you know, that, that would have been an amazing show. And, and uh, but it didn't come to be. I think something happened with the city of Pasadena or something uh, uh but the show ended up not happening but wow. uh, oh what been. stories that could have yeah man about that but uh, uh you know the the grateful dead are one of those bands um uh over the years i've 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 been able to perform with some of those guys a couple of the guys in the band and um uh i remember it was like around 19 it was like it was towards the end of when Jerry was playing with, you know, before Jerry passed on. And I remember one morning, my wife and I were reading the, the morning paper and we were like, oh, wow, the Grateful Dead are coming to town. They're going to be five nights at the L.A. sports arena. And I looked at my wife and I said, we should go. We had both <laughs> never seen the dead. And I said, Jerry's looking like he's getting up there in age, you know, don't want to miss the boat on this. He's still playing. Let's go see him. So we bought a pair of tickets just going just almost for the historical thing of it. Oh, we're going to get to see Jerry Garcia. And little did I know that when I went to the show or we went, it was one of the maybe top three concerts of my lifetime. Yeah. They just blew me away. I thought they were the sound, the show. The, I mean, everything was just, it was incredible. And I yeah. wasn't expecting that to happen. 
I yeah. thought, oh, I'm just going to go see the dead. And, da, da, da. and I've heard sometimes that, you know, because they're very jammy that they could be hit and miss sometimes. I've heard that from a lot of people. Yeah. But yeah. when I, I heard them, man, they were astounding. What, so, what year was that? Well, he died. What year did Jerry die? I think it would What's have been around 94, about? maybe That's somewhere funny. in there. I think so. That, that sounds yeah. about right. That's what I would think. Yeah. So, I, so this is probably him, right before he died. Yeah, they said that was the last time he ever played L.A. Yeah. So maybe he played gigs maybe for another year or so, but I don't think much longer than that. Uh, I know what you're saying, because I saw them in 83 and I wasn't like a deadhead and I had the same sense of same thing, hit or miss and jam band and long. It was a fantastic show, one of the best shows. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And of yeah, course, happy the, to be for it. I was so it was so cool. Yeah. And I remember one thing, too, you know, when, when you uh, uh, they were so organic. They yeah. were so just about, no, we're, it's just about the music. This isn't about anything else. And I remember Jerry walks out on stage and he just, like, people are, yeah, yeah. And, like, he must have spent three minutes going up to his amp. Bing, 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 you know, turning, messing with it, working with his tone, bing, 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 you know. It was like, yeah, you know, it was like, <laughs> okay i think i'm ready he turned around walked up to the microphone and it just started the first song that's cool it, 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 you know i i just thought i love that i thought it was cool awesome man uh all right so you have such a long career i don't even know where to start but um you've done so much as a musician and as a music professional to develop so many different skill sets what did you start out doing musically uh, I came from a musical family and my, both of my mother and father both played guitar and they used to do, they used to sing like a, uh, uh, all the hits of the early fifties, late forties. And, um, and my dad played guitar, my mother played rhythm guitar and they could sit down at a family gathering or a party or whatever, and they could sing for hours and hours and hours and never, never uh, uh, redo a song. And so I, and I remember being a kid watching men cry when my mother sang. And wow. I just like, I thought just like, wow, that's amazing that they're watching and they're just like crying. And she had that kind of voice. And so my mother taught me how to play guitar when I was, like six years old, she taught me my first chords. And I remember going in for a, uh, when I was around seven or eight years old, my dad decided that I should go in for, for guitar lessons. And I remember going in and, and uh, uh, it was a Don's guitar shot or Don's music. It was a little neighborhood mom and pop. And I remember Don was the, was the, uh, the, 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 the teacher. And he sits down and we're going into this book and it was like, Bing, 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 bing. And I was like, and not even holding the strings. It was like, bing, open strings. And I'm looking at, the, you know, he's doing that. He goes, that's going to be the first lesson. And I pull out, I was like, wait a minute, check this out. Do, 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 do. We'll shake it a baby now, you know, so I go into shake. I could already play twist and shout. And I'm like, stop, stop, stop. You can't do that. You can't do it. Well, what, what? He goes, no, 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 no. We can't do that. We're going to do bing, 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 bing. And I was like, oh, wow. wow. And, and I just remember, you know, this isn't for me. That was the first and only lesson I ever had. I went out and I told my dad, I go, no, lessons, I, I think I'm going to just, I wasn't, I just wasn't into it. And where so everything this? I learned, I was just, was self-taught. Where, where, where was this? Where'd you grow up as a young kid? I grew up in, in, in the Los Angeles area in the city of, well, it was actually first called South San Gabriel. It's now called Rosemead. And, and then uh, since I was a little bit out of high school, I've been living in, in, uh, different cities right around there but i now live in san gabriel which is right the next town and san gabriel is right in los angeles we have a we have a i have a church on my uh in my uh, on my street that was built in 1771 wow. so people have been around there a long time that's really cool yeah wow. and so so you know i was learning you know learning how to play and, and uh get you know 
the Beatles and Crosby, Stills and Nash and Neil Young were a lot later were like, as I got into junior high, were really big influences and in like, you know, Woodstock, that sort of thing. I remember my mother took me to see Woodstock uh, when I was in the eighth grade. And I begged her because you had to be 17 or, uh, or you had to have a guardian. My mother took me, I begged her to take me. And that movie changed my life. In, in what I way? Mean, you know, in a way that I, that to see that culture, that culture was so amazing to me The you know, the, the long hair, the jams, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the holy jeans, the, just that whole thing and the music uh, just hit me so hard. And, and uh, so I just wanted to be a hippie after that. I want to let my hair grow. So uh, the ninth, my ninth grade was the first year that the Los Angeles County schools allowed uh, for long hair. So starting in my, that was the first year you were allowed to grow your hair longer than your- Isn't that a funny concept even? Yeah. That, that and they I reg mean, you regulated your hair length. Right. And I got there right when they said, okay, you can grow your hair long. And so freshman year, it was short. My senior year, I had hair all the way down to my, to my, down the back, down my back. And uh, so uh, I was already uh, driving. I was 16 years old. I already had a car and a license. And a friend of mine uh, asked me to help them move into an apartment or, or him and his friend. And so I had my, my little Volkswagen bug and we're loading bags and stuff into this new apartment. And we're in the apartment and we looked up and noticed there was an attic. And so the, uh, my friend and I got a ladder and we were the flashlight. We're looking up in the attic just to see what's up there. And somebody had left a Paul McCartney, uh, a Hofner base but it was a, a, a like a Japanese uh, copy of a of a Hofner bass, but it was like a violin style bass. So we pulled it down, and I opened the can. I'm like, wow, this is cool, you know. Looking at it, and I happened to have fifteen dollars in my wallet, and my friend sold it to me for fifteen dollars. My that bass, and I took it home, and it was like love at first sight. Uh, and I literally slept with it and didn't put it down for 15 hours at, at a time. And so uh, that was it. It was like love at first sight. And I never looked back. Okay. So let me ask you this. Uh, how do you, how do you view events like that? Do you look at them as luck? Do you look at them as uh, like destiny or higher power stuff? Like, how do you, or do you just not even think about it and just say, hey, right place, right time? No, I think about luck. I think there's lucky things. Uh, but I, uh, in a lot of ways, though, I tell people, uh, students or people who ask, I said, you have to also make your own luck. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, to get heard and, to, and for people to know who you are as an artist, you got to get out into the world. I know it's easier now with, with internet or, or with uh, social media, you can just play in your bedroom. And I know there's people that have been discovered that way. Yes. And, and Justin Bieber, I believe, was discovered that way. And, and uh, so it's a little easier in that way. But I still think you have to get out and interact with people. And, and so I think that's a big part of getting out there and being known. Well, you had that curiosity had you not gone up there, but it was like there was a gift waiting for you up there. Yeah, I think about it. And there's a lot of things, a lot of things that we can get into other. There's other stories in that way. How if I if this wouldn't have happened, I wouldn't have been there for that. Right. And and um, I I. Uh, yeah, as we get later down into the years, there's other stories that, that are like that, but that definitely was kind of destiny kind of, yeah. uh, and, and I always had a, uh, I never aspired to be a guitar player. That's the other thing I could, I'm a good picking and a grinning. I play guitar right now, the way I did when I was 10, but I can grin. I have good, you know, good time when I'm strumming, but I can't like take solos on a guitar. I can't, you know, I can't do that. I never could. Right. And it wasn't until I picked up the bass that I want, oh, I want to be a solo bass player. You know, I want to take bass solos. 
and, and I aspired to really technically get good on the bass. And so I started practicing literally all day and I slept, I'd fall asleep with my bass. And I was still living at home. I was 16 years old, still going to school. And within, I would say, months of that, of having that first bass, I remember I, I got to jam. I immediately started jamming with other kids at school. And I, and I remembered my first jam playing with a drummer and a, and, a, and a guitar player. The first time I ever played with a, you know, and I was playing bass. Like, I remember that it's like, it's so uh, vivid. And, and uh, I remember I was just in, a, in, in someone's living room, uh, a little high school party, just a few, not that many people, but it was in, inside the house. And the first song I played was Dazed and Confused. Wow. That was my first. And the guitar player was actually pretty good, uh, the kid from school. And, and so anyway, I, got, I was hooked right away. And, and uh, speaking of Zeppelin, it was, uh, there used to be a TV show. Uh, the first time I ever saw Zeppelin was on, uh, on a live broadcast from Pasadena, pa uh, California, which is where my, my, my stomping grounds. And uh, there, there used to be a, a, a theater in Pasadena, where a lot of bands played, I think they, it was the Rose, the Rose Room, or uh, and, and uh, uh, Perkins Palace was the the theater that they called it back then. And in the '60s, they had a, a TV show uh, live on. Uh, 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 it was like a live TV broadcast on local television, and I used to watch it. It was every Friday night, and one night I'm watching it, and there is this band called Led Zeppelin playing in Pasadena at this little theater. And I saw him do Dazed and Confused. And uh, the guy had the bow and the whole thing. And little, and I ended up getting to see them live in 73 at the Forum wow. uh, during the Houses of the Holy Tour when I was 16. So this was kind of all right around that time. And, and this whole time, your parents were obviously super supportive of your career. Yeah, yeah my yeah. dad, I mean, my dad... Uh, it's crazy, uh, except for a couple little odd jobs. I, they had this thing called a work experience in high school, where the school would send you off just to like these little odd jobs. And, and I did that when I was in high school through the school. But by the time I was a junior and into a senior in high school, I had already started playing five nights a week in clubs, playing in top 40 bands. I was really young and just local bars around the neighborhood. And uh, I, I was making maybe 25, 30 bucks a night. Sure. Uh, but back in 1973 or 74, you would it would have took a week of working at McDonald's to make 30 bucks because yeah. the minimum wage was probably $1.35 or something back then. And, and so for me to go out and play a gig and make 30 bucks, man, I was, was, I, was doing, I was doing very well. Yeah. And I was playing yeah. almost every night. And, and this was all through high school. And, you know, of course, time times were different back then because, you know, they didn't have DJs and clubs and loud, you know, yeah. uh, uh, almost all the bars had live music and even the little bars, they would hire bands to go in and play. And, and so I got to be a part of that. And it, it helped me uh, earn my stripes, as I say, I like to say, uh, playing, you know, those kind of gigs which they only made me better. And it was a really good time. A lot of good funk and, you know, a, a lot of rock and a lot of cool stuff from that era. So it was really fun. Even disco, yeah. you know, when a few years later I was playing in the clubs when disco hit and those bass lines are just amazing. I love those parts, you know, interesting. So it, all, it all kind of helped shape me of what I was going to, where I was going. You got your 10,000 hours really young. You, you know, you got that pretty young. Yeah. Yeah. I got to tell you, you're the first person and I commend you, you're the first person in 850 interviews that said, we're so lucky nowadays because we have social media because you can go and play and get discovered. Most people have oh, social media. Uh, there's no, we need the record companies. There's no more record companies to help us get discovered, but 
I'm sort of like with you in the sense that social media has leveled the playing field. Mm -hmm. Everybody has an equal start. Is it a pain in the ass? Well, yeah, for older guys like us that we didn't grow up with it, but everything is a pain in the ass at one time. And then you do it, you know, riding a bike wasn't easy the first time you rode a bike, you know, and you get used to it. So I really commend your, uh, uh, you know, your mindset on that, because I think I agree. I happen to agree with you there. It's, it's, it, everybody's even. Yeah. I went into, uh, it's, uh, I went into, to, uh, uh, get, get my hair, kind of uh, uh, groomed uh, a couple of weeks ago. And, and as I'm sitting there, my, my, my friend who cuts, who was cutting my hair, uh, turned me on to this, this media, uh, this, this girl from France playing Viger guitars and she's shredding on the, on the guitar. And, and I mean, I would have never discovered this girl, you know, and, and there I am. And, and, and we spent the whole time there watching all this girl's videos. And she looks like she's like in high school and right. just ridiculous chops. Yeah. And, you and, and you cannot see that any other way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So what were some of the challenges you had early on after you're out of high school and, and to get things up and running? Um, well, I, when I graduated from high school, uh, and I was still, uh, uh, I, I ended up going, to, I, I want, I really enjoyed school, by the way, I liked high school and, and, and I, I, um, ended up going to East LA college, uh, here in LA and, and, uh, they had a really good music program there. And I, I ended up taking, uh, you know, getting a, going for a music major, you know, I went you know, I full speed into the music program there. And I was in the jazz band. I was starting to getting into swing and, 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 and that sort of thing. Playing with a big band was amazing. And during, while I was going to East LA college, uh, there's a club in Hollywood called the Viper room, sure. which is a famous club. And, uh, it back in the mid seventies, I was playing in the house band there. And the, the club was called filthy McNasty's. And I used to play there five nights a week uh, during the time I was going to East LA College. That was a, probably an amazing gig to have. It was fun. Yeah, it was. It was. Yeah, it was right there in the middle of the sun, Sunset Strip and and all that. And and uh, so one night this gentleman uh, uh, came up to me during break time and said, there's a band looking for a ba they're auditioning bass players and uh here's the number if you you should go down i really think you should go check it out it's a cool gig da, da, da. and i ended up going down and i got the gig and, uh, and the very first gig uh we was with the band el chicano and uh they were on universal or mca records at the time major label band they had had a couple of hits by that time a few years earlier and the first gig was opening for Santana in a baseball stadium in front of 40,000 people. That was your Albuquerque, first gig. Mexico. My first gig with Al Chicano. And that was Holy my first shit. gig where I actually left town to go do a gig. And, and it might have been the second time I ever flew in an airplane. And, and, uh, and so we went to Albert. And so after I took that gig, they ended up wanting me to do some more touring. And we ended up going to Southeast Asia. I got to tour all over Southeast Asia and some other gigs around town with other bands uh, around uh, LA, uh, the U.S. And so I had to, how you say, I had to like say goodbye to school because yeah. I couldn't be two people at the same time. And I regrettably, or maybe not, decided to like to quit school and go off and tour. And luckily the touring never stopped. Right. From that point on, one thing led to the next, and this led to that, and and almost to this day, you know, uh, and and really starting around that time, uh, for about the next twenty years, that's all I did was play bass and and uh, and tour and and record. You know, that was my main thing. It wasn't production. It was mainly just being a bass player, uh, performer. Starting around that time. So that was a hell of a good experience for you, that, that uh, oh, El Chicano. Oh, that was amazing. They were an incredible band, really great players. 
uh, Jerry Salas, Rudy Regalado, uh, 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 Mickey, uh, yeah, Mickey Lesbron, uh, just great players. And and getting to hang out with Santana in, around that time, and, and and we even got to jam a little bit. Uh, what was that music. like? They, they were yeah. like exploding. Well, they were already like iconic by then. This would have right. been around seventy six, something right around there. And um, uh, yeah, it was it was pretty cool being around that. And and then you know, uh, night after night playing big shows and going first time ever going to another country. You know, we went to Southeast Asia and the band had hit records there so that we, we drew really good crowds. So it was really good experience. That's wonderful, man. For a kid, especially like, you know, I was like, Whoa. And again, world out there. What, what is the randomness of some guy walking in and saying, Hey, I think you should uh, go for, for this. Odd. It wasn't like it was a buddy of yours who said, it, you know, hey, John, you know, I mean, how how crazy is that? Well, one thing I like I tell uh, uh, and I've always lived this is that uh, you always bring, you know, music is a joyous thing. And when I play, it's all about the joy of it. And 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 that part of that is playing with people you really love to play with and people you love, you know, it's a when you get to play with a lot of people for a long time, it's like, it's like a family. And, and uh, sometimes the, 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 uh, the gigs aren't the best, but you always got to bring your a game and play like, play like it's 40,000 people just put on a good show and, and play hard. And you never know who's going to be out there. And, and uh, uh, um, you know, part of that is uh, I, one time I was playing a, a top, gig in my neighborhood and and this guy comes up to me and is it, it turned out uh it was patrick moraz he was a keyboard player for the moody blues yeah and, yes, and uh amazing keyboardist and he came up to me and says man i really like your singing and your and your your playing i'm going to be doing a record in la in a month here's my you know can i get your number i want to call you sure enough he called me and and uh, and that was the very first record I ever did was with Patrick Moraz. Wow! This was, like in the, this was like in the late '80s, or I'm sorry, early early '80s. Uh, 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 it was the his solo album Time Code. And again, you got it. Well, doing what you said, you're out there. I was just playing. No, was no playing one's coming day. knocking on your door, man. And and another example, and this you know how this happens. I was playing at a little bar in Pasadena that my, where, you know, my, once again, my, my stomping grounds at this place called the Old Town Pub, where I played hundreds of times over the years. I first played there when I was 16 or 17 years old. And, uh, 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 and what I was playing there in like, this would have been late nineties. And, and I was playing, I had a band uh, called uh, Sid and we were sometimes called the Sid All-Stars or the All-Stars. And it was with Johnny Hernandez Vatos from Boingo and my brother Sam on keys. And we had a smoking kind of a blues and rocking band. And we used to pack the joint. It was always an amazing gig. And one night we're playing and these guys, a couple of guys came in and, and people, they were like, hey, that's Steve Vai, that's Steve Vai. And I was like, I didn't even know what Steve Vai looked like, you know, because I, 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 I really wasn't familiar with his music at that time. And I didn't know what he looked like. And they were saying, oh, no, they said Steve Vai was here. And what, like a week later, I get a call from Steve Vai. No. And, and sure enough, man, I heard you playing at this bar in Pasadena and would love to get you on my record. And I ended up playing on one of his records. That is so cool. With uh, Greg Bissonette. Yeah, and yeah, the drummer. Johnson, that's where I got to play with Eric Johnson and Steve Vai. That's wild, record. man. I find it so interesting. Uh-huh how in everybody's lives there are these moments that are so uh, you know in many cases like in the case you finding the base uh, completely life-altering yeah. oh yeah, yeah it's very magical to me yeah there's some crazy coincidences that happen some for the good some for the bad Right, right. And, and, you know, you just wonder, a lot of times I have to, I kind of just pinch myself and said, I can't believe I'm here and this is happening. 
Yeah. In a, good way. a lot of times for gigs, you know. Uh, I definitely felt that when I got to play with Neil, uh, this feeling of like, just, you know, because I, I, I literally grew up with him and it was such a thrill to play with him. Well, let's uh, let's talk about it. How did that, you're talking about Neil Young. Yeah. How did that come about? Um, well, it, um, uh, Lucas Nelson and Promise of the Real, it started, it actually, this whole thing starts with uh, school. Uh, when I first started teaching, I was at, uh, I was teaching at Citrus College in Glendora in the LA area, San Gabriel Valley. And I was the artist in residence there. It was the first time I started teaching. That is that story. Let me get to that story first. And how okay. this, this all leads to Neil. Uh, one morning, my wife and my, at the time, my daughter was around 16, 17 years old. Uh, the three of us went to Starbucks to get a cup of coffee. And so we're go, we go to our local Starbucks right here in the neighborhood. And we walk in and there's a band playing at Starbucks. And I was like, I've never to this day since or <laughs> after that heard a band ever play at Starbucks. And we went in and, and this band, they were like, young they were college age looking kids and they were playing these exquisite arrangements of these jazz tunes and and like instead of having sax and trumpet typically they had like oboes and bass clarinets and you know it was just like ellington-ish you know yeah. and and i we sat there like oh my god they're so good you know and then they go into the song pure imagination the willy wonka song okay and da, 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 and uh, so my daughter uh, is uh, uh, a gifted jazz singer, and, and that's a whole nother story. Uh, she, uh, she, she, uh, uh, she goes, Dad. You know, I do that song, uh, "Pure Imagination," and she goes, "Man, it would be great to record that this band." And 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 I go, "You're right." I go, "Let me uh, talk. Let me go up and talk to these guys." So I'm a total stranger. I go up and say hello to these guys. Hey, I'm John, and I'm, I have a studio a block away from here. You guys are great. My daughter is sings a, uh, a pure imagination, and I made a deal, I, or not a deal, just uh, uh, I said, uh, anytime you guys want, maybe this week. Uh, and we ended up doing it, I think, the next day. I said, but come over to my studio. I'll record you for free. And I'll do like, say two songs. And then uh, the third or fourth song, uh, can you do a version with Pure Imagination with my daughter? And they ended up, okay, we'll do it. And and so they came to my house, we recorded, uh, uh, I believe it was three or four songs. And, uh, and in a four hour session, recorded, mixed it, put it on a CD and say, thank you guys, that was great, da, da. No, not a word. About a week later, I get a call from the dean of Citrus College, and it turns out that's where these kids went. They were they went to they were part of the music program, and the the dean uh, um, uh, he he uh, he calls me up and says, "Hey, I I got the CD uh, of this recording you did," and he goes, "It's absolutely incredible," and your daughter's voice is like, we can't believe that this is coming out of a 16 year old. She's really, at the time she was, she was, and she still is incredible singer, but to hear somebody that young right. sing the way she sang. And so they, he asked if he can have a meeting with me and, and I, and they approached me about teaching at the school and we had a meeting and I, and I'm, you know, I'd never taught before. And, and so I'm like, you know, I'm, we'll make you the artist in residence. And they ended up giving me an honorary degree to be able to teach there. And so I ended up teaching a songwriting workshop there. And that's how it all started. And then eventually they asked me to produce a, a, a big band album featuring my daughter. And I only agreed to do that if I got to write at least half the songs. <laughs> I said, well, yeah, I said, you know, everyone does all the standards, but let's do some original music. And, and so I ended up, you know, uh, writing songs for this for this uh, album, uh, and the record came out. And the drummer uh, in all of this was this kid named Anthony Logerfo, 
Anthony was 19 years old. And after one of our classes at school, he chased me out to my car. He ran up to my car. Mr. Avila, Mr. Avila, here's my card. Uh, my, you know, if you ever need a drummer, give me a call. And, and, and he has me his car and I, hey, Anthony, thank you. You know, you're, you're really good. I will definitely keep you in mind. You're a good drummer, da, da, da. Stuck in my wallet and I got in my car and I drive home 20 minutes. I go in and there's my daughter. She's the 16, 17 year old sitting in the living room playing piano. And I had my upright bass in there. So her and I start jamming electric bass or upright bass and piano. She goes, man, it would be so cool if we had a drummer right now. Oh my God. And I said, you know what? This kid just gave me a dr his card. Let me call him up. So 20 minutes after he handed me his card, I called him up. So you say you want to play, huh? How about right now? He's like, right now? I go, yeah, right now. Bring your drums over and we'll 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 set up and jam. He came over right away. He sets up his drums in my living room. And basically, we've been playing together ever since. What? So uh Wait Anthony, so Anthony, Anthony uh met. Uh, the son of Willie Nelson, Lucas Nelson, right. when they were when they were still when he was still going to school, uh, they met at a Neil Young concert, which is another irony, you know. And and uh, so Anthony, uh, we, you know, we had already been jamming and stuff. I I actually he was so good that uh, I was asked to uh, um, I at one point I was asked to to MD a Jackson Brown gig. And they wanted me to put the gig to put the band together to back up a Jackson Brown show uh, uh, for a benefit concert he, we were going to be doing. And so I did. And I remember them calling and saying, hey, we need a drummer. Who can you recommend? And I remember Anthony was here and I said, I got a drummer. So Anthony ends up. So playing, he's playing drums with Jackson Brown. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, and uh, so he brings me Lucas Nelson and uh, uh, and uh, Lucas was 19 years old. And uh, and I ended up producing their first demo, their little EP, like about five or six songs. And so I was there from the very beginning of that band. So that band ends up, you know, I did uh, another tour. Their bass player was a friend of mine and he went on a uh, on a, uh, a paternity leave. And so I jumped in to cover for him while he was having babies and all that for three months. And uh, uh, and so during that three months, I got to tour and we ended up going to Willie's uh, uh, studio in, in Austin and we re and we recorded another album there and I got to play. And, and, and that was when the year I did um, uh, Farm Aid, this would have been 2010 and Farm Aid uh, in it was this was in Milwaukee. And during that, that when I got to play, there was Neil Young, uh, Dave Matthews, Willie Nelson, uh, uh, Nora Jones were all there, you know, uh, part of this, this gig. And I remember we're out on stage playing for 50,000 people and there's Neil right there. And we were like, oh my God, this is like, um, it was so much fun playing the show. And uh, uh, apparently Neil, Neil really dug the band and, and we got word that Neil was really digging the band. And eventually as time went on, uh, Promise of the Real end up, they started jamming together and eventually they end up becoming his backup band. Oh my. And this all started because you were like basically sort of kind to these guys at Starbucks. And, or the fact that I even I was needed a coffee. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And so and so Anthony ends up calling me at school. This would have been 2016. Uh, Anthony calls me at school. Hey, man, uh, 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 Corey, who is the regular bass player, Corey can't make a gig. Uh, we need you for a gig, uh, but we need you to come to Paris. And it's with Neil. <laughs> and and I'll, I go, oh, let me check my schedule. Okay. Yeah, yeah, right. right. <laughs> let me see if I can do that. Okay, I'll do it. That's and, wild. And, uh, so, I, so I got to go to Paris and play with Promise of the Real with Neil Young. And wow. And spent, spent a couple of days. I uh, spent a week there, actually. And so that was an incredible experience. And Neil was really fun to work with. Wow. I'm just so, uh, I just want to point out again to people listening that this started by john doing something nice and getting interacting with other people you know even if it was totally self-motivated because you wanted to get your daughter exposed and working with these guys 
you did you connected with somebody for something and i like what you said earlier you got to get out there you know a lot of people uh well why isn't this happening to me why isn't this happening to me it nothing's going to happen unless you get out there man yeah people and, make and, this things happen and even some of the gigs you think are not the coolest gigs you never know who's in the audience and yeah my best gigs came from people in the audience who came up to me and you know, and, and, and we're impressed and Hey, can I get your number? Da, da, da. And even with all my recordings, uh, you know, all these gigs lead to other gigs, even right. like doing mariachi al Bronx led to madness or, and, and right. the band Quetzal, the mariachi al Bronx were fans of Quetzal and, and uh, this band I did in the, in the early two thousands and, and, and uh, Joe before I have a really great sounding drum room. Okay. And, uh, and and where I do a lot, where I get live drum sounds and uh, and and uh, uh, and I had done the Quetzal record there and Joby was like, no, we got to do the record there in that room. That room is where we're, you know, with the magic. And that's where we did the first two albums. The Mariachi Al Bronx. Yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. Man. But uh, so I'm really blessed with that, that this great sounding room and this really cool awesome studio that I have that's just been building since the early, late 90s and, and but that, that's a whole nother thing uh the other thing uh that you know where you making your own luck um you know the whole production thing happened from just me being curious uh um when when after I had done my bass tracks and things I would still show up to the studio even though I wasn't needed just to watch everything going down watch Danny Alpin doing vocals and things like that. And, and uh, one, like one night, it was after we had done the second, it was during the second album I did with them. Um, uh, Danny was in the studio uh, recording vocals. And I show, I knew they were going to be with Steve Bartek, the other co-producer of Boingo, uh, who's a guitar player. Uh, the, he was producing Danny doing some lead vocals and one night, I'm just there sitting in the back of the room, being quiet, just observing, watching. And I had this idea, a vocal melody line or an idea that would uh, counter melody or something. I went to Steve. I go, hey, Steve, you know, Danny should maybe try this and da, 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 you know, maybe see if that works. And I went back and I sat down and Danny and Steve presses the button. Hey, uh, John thinks you should maybe try try this you know he had an idea he ends up doing it and the idea ended up something that worked danny ended up liking it. oh cool you know cool i like that that was good da, da, da. that was it that was the only thing i think i might have said that night and that night after when i went home the phone rings out when i was at home and it's danny alvin saying hey john can you uh Steve can't make the the uh, session tomorrow. I'm going to be doing more vocals. Would you mind coming down and just kind of wow. watching over, you know, helping me because I we didn't have a producer. So I showed up the next night and I got to, you know, what I didn't even know what I was doing, but it was producing or making uh, suggestions or helping Danny as he was vo doing his vocals. And that was literally the birth of my production of my studio uh production career and and i and i kept coming back to more sessions and danny and steve gave me my first uh studio uh, my first production credit i was given the credit of a uh, deputy vocal producer <laughs> on the on the boingo record yeah and then the next album we did after that was boingo alive that was uh back then you know oingo boingo never made it to pro tools Right. We were one of the last of the vinyl uh, bands, you know, every record, everything we ever did was analog vinyl, you know, and, uh, and I am proud to say we did a 31 song album to tape, and it was recorded and mixed in 19 days. Wow. People, when I hear that, I was like, what? And this is not the Pro Tools where you can fix things and all. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. This was like, oh, let's, we're playing it onto a tape. And, and, you know, so it was a tight band and we did a lot of songs where we, we redid some of the songs, but we had a couple of newer songs also, but uh, it was during the recording of that record that Danny and Steve approached me and said that they wanted, they asked if I would be interested in being a production partner. And, That's and, awesome. and uh, so I, all the records after that became 
uh, were, uh, the production credit was produced by Danny Elton, Steve Bartik, and John Avila. And so that was the beginning of when I started really getting into the being in the studio all the time. And uh, one of the things that that was um, important for me that paid off later was watching everything the engineers did. And what mic are you using? Why? Why? How did? You, how did you make it sound so good? Oh, it's going through this compressor. Oh, do you hit the EQ first, the compressor next, or you know, just asking these kind yeah. of questions? Why are you using that mic and not, why not this one? And and um, uh, um, uh, you know, there's some great stories from engineers, and I know you probably heard a bunch how technically guys have their ways of doing things. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's even just like Pro Tools when you learn Pro Tools. I learned Pro Tools from a, an 18 year old kid, a, a little kid with like a student, kid. one of your like students. A, uh, no, he, uh, he was a friend of my niece's. Okay. And my niece brought this band. This is another thing. I When I first opened my studio, the first two years it was open uh, so that there was no pressure on me because I was still learning how to engineer myself and how to mix records or do that. Um, uh, I would I recorded everyone for free for two years. Man, that is such a great idea. It's like walking down Costco and taking a bite of this and a bite of that. And you're getting free tuition at mastering and mixing and all and engineering. Which yeah. Is, that's so clever. And so I, that was for me. So my niece, my niece brought a band in called front side. It was one of the first bands I recorded here. One of the first records where I was, when we finished, I was like, wow, that's actually sounding good. You know? <laughs> and I was up to uh, 16 tracks. I had a 16 track Fostex and, and uh, uh, really starting to get, you know, better than average sounds but uh that was how i that was how i got better you know producing and recording was just learning on the job and not feeling the pressure of charging people and and um you know and and right after uh oingo boingo ended uh, you know if we want to move a little further on the uh is i i uh, i got hit up to re produce this band called real big fish Oh, and yeah. Real Big Fish was a part of the ska movement, uh, uh, an uh, amazing band. They were very young. Uh, most of them were teenagers. And that opened up a lot of doors because we had a, a really good uh, kind of song that got played a lot on the radio, Sell Out by Real Big Fish. And uh, after that record came out, it, it was successful. Uh, a lot of other bands started coming to me after that, you know, and I had finished... Uh, uh, you know, working with, with Oingo Boingo. And, and, it, and I actually started turning down tours. Uh, I got calls from different artists that wanted me to go out. And, and I was just like, man, I just finished decades of being out on the yeah. road. I wanna, I'm really trying to, you know, I was already in my 40 or reaching 40. I was right around 40. And I'm like, man, I'd been doing this since I was in high school. And I, I really wanted to try something different. And still playing, you know, don't get me wrong, I still love to play, but I really wanted to get into that side. So that's when I just made it a point to stay in town and get better in my production chops. And, and you're like a, a very, like you've mentioned family several times here. So I'm assuming you've had like maybe long time relationship with your yeah. spouse. Yeah, yeah. So that's really. That's, I got lucky in that department. I've been married uh, right now 39 years. That's awesome, man. Congratulations. Married, that, you. That's your biggest accomplishment. Oh, that, boy. It is, man. It. That's a good one, man. Awesome. I have two awesome daughters and, and uh, you know, so very lucky. And, and my kids and my family, they grew up at shows. So they got yeah. to grow up at Oingo Boingo shows and all the shows even since then. How, let's take a step back. How did you get hooked up with Danny to, to get in, uh, to join Oingo Boingo? Well, uh, the Oingo Boingo, um, um, right around 70, well, one night in 1979, and this is another story. <laughs> of someone listening, hearing you play, and all of a sudden this happens, but that happened again. I was playing at this at this club called Josephina's, and it was in Sherman Oaks in the Valley. That's a popular club, because I've heard yeah, that. Yeah, back in the day. So was, many times here. It was the jam session uh, was Monday night there, and uh, the, the house band at the time was the band Rufus. Wow. And... Wow. and, and uh, it was some of the members of Rufus, and there was also another drummer, uh, 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 
uh, who, Mouse Johnson, another drummer, Mouse Johnson, who also was putting this all together, but they were all great players. Guitar player played with Stevie Wonder. And, uh, uh, there's a lot of great players. And uh, Bobby Watson, the, dr the bass player of Rufus, the story I heard was he was in, in Japan and couldn't make it back in time to make the gig. <laughs> And so I got a call like two hours before gig time. It sounded like I was probably the 11th bass player they called. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? It was like, uh, can you do it? Can you do it? And I was like, and, and at the time, I was playing six nights a week at the Red Onions in, in L.A. It was like a, a, one of the top L.A. top 40 gigs. Okay. You know? And so Monday was my night off. And so they called me on Monday to come in and and play and i ended up going in and uh they asked me to come back they said oh bobby can't mend and bobby ended up not coming back from japan so i ended up jumping into that gig so i was playing so you were playing seven, seven nights a week seven nights a week and at one point i reached i uh, uh 121 straight nights in a row without wow, a night off that's that's brutal man that's tough yeah i used to play a lot but it was during this uh it was during the place at Josephina's when uh, this uh, this guy came up to me during break time, and uh, and said, "Hey, there's a, a band. I'm I'm in town finishing up a record. This band's on EMI. Uh, they're called Triumvirate. And Triumvirate was during the, the leading up to there. They were like the Emerson, Lake, and Palmer of 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 Germany. Okay, and, and so." The guy hits me up that uh, this was on a Monday and he goes, I'll give you a very good bonus to say yes. I'll write you a check to say yes. And I'll pay you. I forget what it was, 750 or 800 a, a week to which that night I was probably making 75 bucks, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, so the guy, you know, I'll pay, <laughs> but you have to be on uh, you have to be uh, on the plane on Thursday. And this was a Monday. And, you know, at the time, I'm, I'm what, I'm 21 years old. Uh, uh, I'm just a kid, you know, just kind of, I had no girlfriend at the time. I'm just like, it was an opportunity to go to Europe. Yeah. And so I ended up jumping on it. So I'm, so on Thursday, I'm going to the airport and I start thinking to myself, I said, you know, I'm going to a country I've never been, a continent for that case, I've never been. I'm going to play with a band I haven't met except for one guy. Um, I said, when I step off the plane in Germany, I could be anything or anybody at that moment. And that's what I'll be to them. So I said, I could change it up a little bit. So on the way to the airport, I stopped in Venice beach and I went into a, a hair cutter and I got a, a, I got a, like a Mohawk. I got a Mohawk. And okay. I got, so this was I, like, uh, uh, what is it like uh, pe people play another character almost? Yeah. I just, I just messed. I played with it. So said, what not? made you think of that? That's like really cool. It made me think, it made me think of it that I, it was just the thought that, and, and I pictured myself stepping off the plane and I think, and I said, they don't know me. So why not be any change, be something different or just. That's so interesting, that. man. And so I got a Mohawk. And and I and and it was right when punk rock was hitting. Okay. And uh, uh, the, you know, 1979. It was in Europe. I remember the the, the song "One Step Beyond" by Madness was on the radio. <laughs> and, and the you know the Clash. I think were already playing by then. I don't know the Dead Kennedys, and and it was just a really fun time. And I was and I ended up living in Cologne for a year and toured Europe around that time with, and did gigs with 10 CC. And during that time, actually in 79, I got to see queen uh, at the, in, in Cologne in a big, a big uh, arena there in Cologne. Now and, they didn't speak English back then very much. How did you, oh, you, you don't, or did the they? Older, younger people spoke English. More. Okay. Okay. That's cool. So well, it was no communication. No, I had no problem in, uh, you know, communicating with the band. Or, and, or oh, let, you must people. have been the stud, like the American, like I, you, you, women must have been all over you. I mean, you don't, I'm oh, not looking God. for details, but you're like well, an American guy in 79. Well, like. I wouldn't say that, but uh, <laughs> uh, it was, it, it was, 
when you're young like that and you're in a when you go to a, a exotic or different or strange place it is romantic yeah in that I'm way. sure yeah you know? I'm sure and, and so like even being in southeast asia to me it was just like oh you know you're yeah on because it's new right and, and being in germany was like that and playing with new people and but it was during that time that i i started wanting to uh pl- you know at the time before that i was playing kind of more funk and kind of more groovy stuff and i wanted to freaking rock and okay. and and so i started writing and 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 kind of taking in the style of wanting to do something more punk rock and just more pure in that way and so it was there that i started thinking up with the idea of doing uh this band food for feet and that was a band that I started. It, it, it originally started, I actually got a guitar player friend of mine from LA, Mike, Michael Tovar, a gig with Triumvirate. Uh, and he flew in and did the gig with us. And Michael and I started uh, Food for Feet right there. When we were in Germany, we started coming up with, the, started writing the first couple of songs. And so uh, the, 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 the Triumvirate gig ended. Tovar and I went back to LA and we decided, man, let's just, let's keep this going. So, uh, and you had, you, and I'm assuming you had a pile of cash and you, you like got paid well through this whole thing, as you said. So that was a really, not only, uh, uh, uh into, intellectually and musically, it was a rewarding experience, even financially for you. It was, you know, it was, de- they, it was nice. They put us That's up in great. a really nice house. And, and I, you know, I'm keep in mind, I'm still a kid, You're a kid you know, yeah. home and I, I definitely had some money. I didn't have to get a job, you know, and yeah. I was able to afford having in my, uh, in fact, Tovar and I believe were, were, uh, were sharing a, a house. Okay, and, cool. and so we decided, okay, well, let's find a drummer. Let's see if we can find some drummers to jump drum with. And from my Josephina days, I had met and hung out with Dave Garibaldi, okay. drummer of Tower of Power. Right. And so he was one of the first drummers we started jamming with. We would go to his house and we were working out songs, you know, kind of writing songs with him or just jamming, basically, you know. And uh, and and it just didn't work out in the fact that he lived really far away. We wanted to find somebody a little closer. We found this other drummer that we were playing with. Uh, and, and we, our first gig was at, oh yeah, we were playing at Madame Wong's <laughs> in, in, uh, in Chinatown and Madame Wong's was like a, a punk rock club where the police played there. You know, it was like, it was like a really cool place. And I remember we were up, we were there, that was our first gig. And one of the very first gigs we played there, I invited Johnny Batos, who I had met just a little bit earlier. We met on a jazz gig. We were playing bebop with this guitar player. That's and wild. We, and we met and we started talking, we started jamming. And, and it turns out we're both from San Gabriel, but he was a few years older than me. So I never went to school with, with him and didn't really, ne- had never hung out with him, but after we met and played together, we just started jamming together immediately, like to this day, you know, and, and uh, so uh, uh, I invited to- uh, Vatos to come to a show and, 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 and it was that night that the drummer gave us notice that he was leaving on tour and he wasn't going to be able to make the rest of the gigs we had lined up. So I invited John to play with us and, and that was it. He ended up taking over the gig. He this is the, the punk. The punk, it was, it was punk. Yeah, that, it was definitely, we were playing all the, the Hollywood clubs in LA and um, one really great experience from that era, how you never know who's in the audience. We used to do, this would have been around 1980 and we used to do a, uh, uh, we had we used to do Manic Depression, the Hendrix song. Great, in a it's, punk? Yeah, very punk, very wild, but we did it like Hendrix, but you know we more aggressive but yeah i guess you could say i yeah. mean i thought hendrix did it quite aggressively but yeah he brought that spirit and we did it ah, you know the, the 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 change was instead of manic depression i changed the lyrics to hispanic depression that's so funny and and so i had all these lyrics hispanic that went with, dip- yeah. depression lives in my soul that's great 
and and, <laughs> and and who used to come in to see us play a couple of times mitch mitchell from that's the, crazy mitch from mitchell Hendrix. used to come in and, and and he saw us play and we actually got to get him up on stage with us and we did we got to play hispanic depression with mitch mitchell that's so hilarious that's definitely man. one for the books there god i can't believe these stories this is like uh nuts this is amazing all right uh have you ever thought of writing some of these down and putting a little book together man uh i've been approached and there's actually um this is this is another thing that maybe for some of you people who might be starting out i'm very nerdy in a lot of weird little nerdy ways uh, I just, I'm kind of, I don't know. I, to me, I call it nerdy, but one of my nerdy little things is uh, um, I decided that because I've never had a regular job ever, you know, if, uh, once I started playing, no one, when you go and you punch in, you get your paycheck, they keep track of everything, how much money you've made up to then. And, and, you know, you, how much taxes they took out and all that stuff. It's right there on the piece of paper. And I said, I've never had that because I've never had a job where I had to punch in. So I thought to myself, I go, I should do that myself. Uh, I should just keep track of the gigs I play, how much money I'm making, just so that I have that for my own reference. Yeah. I can know how well I'm doing financially compared to the year before or the year after. So on January 1st, 1975, I started logging my gigs. My, my uh, it started with number one, January first, nineteen seventy-five, and I started logging the band I played with, the date, who who I played with, who was in the band, sure, the location, the the address or the the name of the venue, the city, and then how much money I made. And on January first, I started that, and it's been going ever since up up until. It's been nonstop up until uh, Friday's gig with Ozo Motley in Denver. That's amazing, man. That's really smart. That you, I mean, again, another thing that you just kind of did, but now you've got this literally history of your life, your musical life, man. And, you know, if you took 10% of those gigs you, you it would still be probably too big of a book but you know i mean you could i mean seriously these are great stories uh yeah, we never but we never got to uh oingo boingo what bet who's that <laughs> uh like how you oh, oh so i was getting to how i how right. i got how i ended up with oingo boingo Correct. how i ended up with them uh 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 i auditioned uh, so I had been playing with Johnny Batos in Food for Feet right. for a couple of years. And this is... Uh, oh, so this became a, like a legit band. Yeah, Food for yeah. Feet. We, yeah. we were signed to Dr. Dream Records, and it was together for 10 years. We did. We had two records out. And, uh, and then when I started playing with Boingo in 84, for a, a good six-year period, I, had, I was in two touring bands with two record deals. That's uh, great. Right the 90, and then food for feet ended in 90. But um, yeah, I, 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 Vatos uh, told me that their bass player, the Boingo bass player was leaving and they were auditioning and they had a lot of bass players, I believe, auditioned. And, and, and this is another story that, that coincides with that. Uh, I had uh, uh, about a month earlier, I had auditioned for another gig, and this was also through Josephina's a okay. connection. I had, this was kind of a funky, jazzy, funky gig uh, with this artist who was a, a major label artist. Uh, I auditioned for that, and it came down to between me and another guy. And the other guy was a big fan of the band, is what the guy told me. This is what the artist told me. He goes, yeah, he was a big fan. He knew all the songs. It was just going to be little or no work for me. Right. But with, if I got, if I pick you, I really like your playing, but it's going to be a lot more work. He was honest with me, you know? Yeah. Goes, so I'm going to go with the other guy. I just want to appreciate you coming to the audition. And that was going to be probably a seven fifty a week gig, you know? And, and, but back then that was good money. I was like, Oh man, that's Absolutely. A darn it, man. You know? Oh, well, I didn't get the gig and I was, pretty bummed about it but if i would have got that gig and that gig would have ended probably a month later i wouldn't have been around for the oingo boingo audition 
which lasted 11 years yeah and changed uh, your life last to this day you yeah. know it was a life-changing gig as opposed to not getting a gig that would have ended a month later and so something that was really disappointing turned into the best thing that ever happened to me yeah so a lot of times you have to like don't take don't take uh things that maybe don't necessarily seem good at the time could turn out to be the best thing that ever happened to you man i agree i, I have this expression you can't connect the dots moving forward and mm. i think so many times i'm at the point where something doesn't go my way i'm so good with it because it, that's happened so many times i'm like okay that means there's another adventure coming up for me that i need to pay attention to right on yeah and it just takes the pressure off you know you're not like uh and and you don't feel like shit and you just like just look forward to the next thing yeah so i totally agree with you on that man yeah yeah, yeah. so 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 then you just you heard about the johnny got you the audition from yeah Bongo. and i and i got the gig and um i remember there's another thing really cool uh from about the audition that comes to mind right now is i come from i come from a very jammy jamming uh background uh i used to get together with friends and we would just set up our stuff in the garage after school and we would just jam out and so jamming to me is a very natural thing. I love when, when a drum beat starts playing, I can jump in immediately and start playing something. It's just right. something that's just a natural thing for me. And so when, with that said, when I went into the Oingo Boingo audition, I'll never forget this. I had, I had, they'd given me about five songs to learn, you know, be ready to play these songs. So I, I only a lad and nothing bad ever happens to me. I forget what songs they were, but it, you know, some of their hits and, and, and uh, so I, I really studied, got the songs down. Okay, here we go. Bam. I'm going to be ready. I'm going to go in there and kill it. So I go into the audition and Danny says, so what songs did you learn? And I pulled out this crumpled piece of paper. and I, I, I go, these songs right here. And he looks at it. He goes, he gets and throws it. I'm not going to play any of these songs. I was like, <laughs> he goes, he goes, he goes, anybody, he goes, any bass player can come in and just learn the notes. He goes, I want to see what you bring to the table. He goes, so we're just going to play some grooves and I want you to just jump in. And oh, see that. That's the music to your ears, man. I said, okay, let's do it. And I remember they started doing some jams and stuff and what came natural to me was to just jump right in and start playing. And so that got me over the first sound. D Danny was, was impressed with that, you know? Right. And then of course, later they, we went over the songs, you know, that, that we were going to do, which I had done my homework. And the other thing was up to that point, I had never, I didn't play with a pick playing bass with a pick up until then. I only played with my fingers and my thumb and, and slapping and that sort of thing. And so they had me a pick and say, oh, only that sounds great the way you're playing it, but try with a pick. And I'm, uh, okay. And, you know, and from my guitar days, I was, I, at least I had the muscles to hold the pick. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I can, I was able to get through it, but I mean, I went home that night and I stayed up till the sun came up practicing pick techniques and and just why did they want you to play with a pick because it does sound better on punk rock on certain songs okay get more of a real distinct more you know uh it, it, certain songs even now when i'm when i'm doing a session uh i'll try if certain things sound better with a pick and there's techniques where you where you palm the the strings sure. and you get a muted pick sound and 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 uh and especially in, in rock and punk rock, do, 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 you just get yeah. more of a, of a precise uh, a sound, eight notes and things like that. And oftentimes, if not most times in certain uh, styles, it sounds better. And now I'm a, I love the pick, you know? Wow. And All I don't right. only play with a pick, but I've, I've, I've done gigs with Boingo where my arm is bright red from rubbing against the neck from just hours of doing that i'd be bright red wow good that was another awesome story man uh how did you what did you do with richie havens i mean that guy's talk about oh, talent well, man 
this is um, another uh, being in the uh, playing a gig in the right place at the right time. Uh, uh, in the early 2000s, uh, this would have been around 2003 or four, I started branching out uh, 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 artistically in different projects, different things. And uh, I got into, uh, around that time, uh, I did uh, theater. I was a musical director and composer for, uh, at the uh, Mark Taper Forum in Los Angeles cool. uh, for a, a play called uh, uh, Culture Clash. Or the, the group that did it was Culture Clash. The play was called Chavez Ravine. And so I was really getting, I really wanted to do other things. So all of a sudden, I'm in a play at the at the music center in downtown playing upright bass and so anyway i was doing other things and uh i also started playing with this performance art band uh, called the mutator and this was a band with five drum three drummers and two or three percussionists i, all I read track. about that that yeah thing. and they when i was researching your stuff yeah and aerialist and light show and extravaganza crazy wild show and they didn't have a bass player and uh uh i i was playing a show in in uh uh in uh park city utah for the for the the film festival they have there you know yeah. what's the guy uh and, robert redford is it robert yeah Red robert yeah. redford's uh, film festival uh this artist that i was producing got asked to open the show there was the uh, the closing party his bass player couldn't make it and so he asked me to do it they flew me in and i did the show we were opening for this crazy wild uh performance art group called the mutator who i had never heard of but when they came out i was literally just sitting there <laughs> watching them like oh my god I was like, I was so blown away. So that night, there was a, a, uh, a blizzard. And I had a session the next morning. I had to make it to, to uh, Salt Lake City to catch a plane to get make it into my session. And so I couldn't find anybody to drive me. It was literally crazy. They said it was the worst blizzard in 10 years. And I had to drive down the mountain and some lady overheard me uh, talking that I needed to get back to South. And she goes, Hey, uh, I'm sorry. I overheard you. She goes, um, I, I, I have to get to my mom's house and I'm going to be driving. I'm driving down the mountain. You're welcome. I'll give you a ride to the airport. And I said, well, yeah. So she, she gave me, uh, 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 she gave me a ride to the airport. I arrived, we drove five miles an hour through a blizzard and when we got to the airport, we walk in, uh, she dropped me off and I walked into the airport and there's nobody in there. It was to be in like six in the morning. And the only person in there was the mutator. Oh my God. And you recognized and that, it from last night. Yeah. From then I saw them perform and they, they were familiar with my work and Oingo Boingo and, and we ended up hitting it off. We were just stranded in this airport. And so we're, we start hitting it off and, one thing led to another. I started jamming with him. And then before you knew it, I was in the band. That's and hilarious, I was the man. only instrument the, for like the first year or two, I was the only instrumentalist. So it was all drums and electronic music. And it was me with my bass and all my pedals. So I, necess I didn't necessarily play only uh, uh, bass parts. Often I would play, you know, whammy and synthetic and crazy wild parts like that. So, uh, so one night, the, uh, we used to play big theaters. Obviously, we couldn't play a small place because we were a big ensemble. And when we used to play in San Francisco, we used to play at the Fillmore in okay. San Francisco. And one night, Mickey Hart from The Grateful Dead was in the audience. And uh, we played this show. And it turns out, we find out Mickey Hart was blown away by, by The Mutator. And, and Mickey Hart was going to be uh, hosting and putting together this, uh, this show at Madison Square Gardens called The Jammies. And it was basically going to be like the Grammys, but the Jammies for, for like jam bands. Show for jam bands, right. for people, for instrumentalists and things like that. And it covered jazz, funk, and, and 
uh, you know, a lot of the jam bands of the era. And I was part of that community. And uh, so he invited us to be the backup band for the jam, the jammies. That is and all these amazing Dave Matthews band were there. Chick Corea was there. And, and one of the artists was Richie Havens. And uh, Richie Havens uh, wanted to, to do the song Freedom, uh, which he did at Woodstock. That's his yeah, most famous yeah. song. And so I got we got to open the show at Madison Square Gardens. We opened the jammies with me and, and Richie Havens and a percussionist doing a, a, a trio jam out of of uh freedom so uh, and and he was an incredible he's no longer with us rest yeah. in peace but uh richie was an incredible human being just an incredible spirit and and an honor to get to play with him and you being impacted by watching woodstock oh how did that that had to like be like a, surreal oh surreal and doing that song yeah, yeah and just rocking i mean and he played with if if not more energy than he did on on on, on the on the movie uh he was just powerful just ugh. and and we just jammed it out so hard and it's just a great musical moment wow. i can actually find it i know there's video of that performance i could find and maybe send to you yeah you well know, i'm putting it in red because i need to go look for that for sure it, there there is out there he, and he's, I think, from New York City, as a matter of fact. So I I'm, believe he yeah, was. Yeah, he's from City he Island, I think. Yeah. yeah, I read a Bob Dylan a biography, and, and he mentions that he was friends with Richie Havens back in the day. Yeah, he was from City Island, this little... Yeah, uh, Rich, there was a funny story, Richie, that Bob Dylan tells in that he says that uh, uh, he learned from uh from richie havens that when bob would be in there a lot of times they'd just pass a hat around this was when they were just playing the 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 folk clubs sure and you know everyone's just starting off and there might be 12 artists in one night but he said richie havens was already like one of the top draws and he you know he was already a star in that little scene and 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 bob dylan said that he he would watch richie come in and play a set but he'd have a real attractive, very well addressed, attractive uh, woman go around with the with the the, the hat. That's good marketing, man. And he said, "Yeah, man, he always got more money than everyone else." And then he started, "Oh man," I, he goes, "I learned from that." And he ended up having a friend of his, a female friend who was very good looking. He goes, "He he hired, he gave her some money to go out and help help pass the hat around." That's that's a that's, that's a, really that's smart. That's a great <laughs> Jimmy. That's a great uh, Richie Havens story. Yeah. And I'm just gonna ask you one more, uh, Stuart Copeland. I mean, you being such a good bass player and playing that had to be pretty cool playing with Stuart Copeland. Yeah, that was wonderful. It that one, that uh, that gig was a little bit out of personally for me out of my wheelhouse, uh, in that. Uh, I got asked to play with him and it wasn't doing police or rock or funk or jam. It was, was his uh, orchestral music that he did for movies. Oh, and so we weren't doing police songs. We were doing his stuff from some of his movies. And um, I just remember being a little worried. The music, I, there was a lot of reading involved and uh, man, and I said there was going to be two rehearsals and a show at the NAM show in, in Orange County. Oh. And, um, you know, I. It's not too much pressure. I was a little concerned. Yeah. You know, I was like, this is definitely not my comfort zone. But I told myself, and I remember telling my wife when I was leaving to go to the rehearsal, I go, if I make it through this first rehearsal, I'm going to do this gig. Right. You yeah. know, and sure enough, the first rehearsal went excellent it was okay. it went very well i was able to get through the songs and 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 stuart was happy the next day it was the second rehearsal stuart is one of these drummers who never plays the same way twice yeah. he's just always searching always trying this and always trying that and and you know so the next day he he's not reading no chart he's just playing his thing you know he's playing and he played it completely different so it was a little hard to remember from the night before wait a minute that's not what he was playing but that's Stuart being Stuart he's trying different things out yeah and yeah. uh and but I got through it and it was cool and then the night of the gig uh the we played at the NAMM show in front of like 1500 people in a big auditorium and and it was 
awesome. You know, what can you say? You're playing with a, I mean, I've never, ever heard a drummer talk shit about Stuart Copeland. No, he's a virtuoso, you know, he's, man. He's, he's one of those guys, yeah. rock drummers, funk drummers, reggae drummers, jazz drummers. Everyone loves Stuart because he just, there's a little bit of everything for everybody in his playing. How did you get that gig? Huh? How did you get that gig? Uh, I, uh, my, actually, it was my manager at the time, Laura Engel. Uh, she approached me about it. I think she had brought up my name uh, so cool. about getting me on that gig. And I have to be honest, a lot of the gigs that happen for me or you're going to find for you listeners out there uh, is the, the gigs you get are from your peers and from your people. And a lot of these people, the person who got me that, that gig, uh, Laura Engel, I remember when she was the assistant to the assistant drum roadie. You know, and I saw her start from the bottom of the level for production, stage production, and she worked her way up to assistant drum roadie to uh, uh, stage manager to to tour manager and on and on. And now to this day, she still manages uh, Danny Altman. And uh, so people, you know, from way, way back when are people who can help you get gigs. And a lot of times it might be somebody you're going to school with right now who 20 years down the, la down the line uh, is going to be the composer for a big TV show and they're going to get you on sessions. Yeah. And I got other sessions. I got other stories. I, we have time to get into that, who the people who've approached me who uh, were kids when they came up to me and ended up becoming huge rock stars. And, me one, and, uh, tell me one story. Tell me one of those. Um, okay. Uh, food for feet we used to play in san diego and uh and and we always were a good draw there there was a this this band called bad radio and they opened for for food for feet maybe on a couple of occasions i know for sure on one occasion and they had a lead singer who was this young kid who was amazing this kind of hippie looking kid and uh and uh and he ended up coming to our gigs after that. He was a big fan of Food for Feet. And he used to always show me, I always remember him. One, he was talented, but he was just this cool guy. And, and, uh, and his name was Eddie. And Eddie was my size. I'm a little guy. Uh, and, and Eddie was eye to eye to me. And, and, and so we called him Little Eddie. Right. And, and so, hey, Little Eddie, he would come and show up to our shows and, and, uh, uh, and was always really kind and nice to us, would help us with our gear and took us out to breakfast before we head back to L.A. Some nights, I remember. And uh, anyway, move forward um, to, uh, say, the earlier early 90s. And, and, and um, I went to Lollapalooza 91 and there was all these bands. It was a great, it was right in the middle of the grunge era. So I got to see Soundgarden and Chili Peppers and Alice in Chains and all these incredible bands and Pearl Jam and, and uh, you know, these incredible bands. And I had taken my nephews with me to the show. And, and I, this was at Irvine Meadows. And uh, I, I, I went there just to see the show. I was in the audience. And but uh, I played Irvine Meadows with Oingo Boingo probably twenty times, uh, and and so I the my nephews asked me to get them backstage, so I go yeah let me go and they recognized me oh Boingo yeah come on in so the three of us went in so this was after the show and we're all hanging out and and all of a sudden uh, my nephew spotted Eddie Vedder. and they go hey there's Eddie Vedder, hey, Uncle John can you get him to sign our our T-shirt. And so I went up to Eddie Vedder and tapped him on the shoulder and he turns around, hey, would you mind signing this t-shirt for my nephews? I hand him the pen and he looks at me, he goes, Avila, Avila, Avila. And he starts jumping, he's like hugging me. And I'm like, where do I know this guy? I, I, I didn't, how do I know Eddie Vedder? And he, then he looks at me, he goes, John, it's me. It's little Eddie from Bad Radio. Oh my God. I go, you're... Eddie, you're a rock star. He goes, yeah, man, you know, and, and I didn't know that little Eddie turned into Eddie Vedder, the rock star. Holy crap. Your nephews must've been over the moon. Yeah. Man. They were, their mouth was to hear. And, and, uh, wow. 
So, I mean, so, you know, yet an, uh, another reason to be nice to people, be kind to people who are appreciative of what you do. You know, uh, you could be a jerk. I mean, I, I can't even think of that, but uh, but it's really important. to People that appreciate what you do, it's really yeah. cool to just be nice to people. And and because you, you never know who's going to be there, who, who these people are going to be. That's amazing. Where man. they're going to go. But that's also what I'm getting back to is your your peers. Yeah. Uh, when you're going to school, you know, you, one of the things that's really important. And, and now because I hire musicians is I want to hire people that I'm comfortable being around. Yeah. And I'm talking people who are not you're just cool and 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 get along with people and, you know, people who take a bath, you know, all those little <laughs> things, you know, and and uh, uh, and those kind of things are important when because uh, I'm going to want to call you back. I'm not going to call a jerk back to come back to a session yeah. or recommend a jerk to go play with somebody, you know, well, so those, well, so one of the things, the characteristics that you come across clearly, clearly presenting is enthusiasm for what you're doing. And, mm -hmm. you know, that enthusiasm is infectious and that carries you a long, long ass way, mm -hmm. you know, because it's like you're bringing energy, man. Who, the, If you're bringing energy, that's such a huge plus because most people don't have as much energy as they need. So you got a guy like you is like so pumped up, so excited, so open about it. It's it's an easy yes, you know, having that enthusiasm. Yeah, I I, I uh, for me it's always been um, uh, ninety nine point nine percent of the time, unless I'm hurting or whatever, uh, uh, or the conditions of the gig might be terrible. But I just always, I just often stop and just have to like can't think that oh my god i can't believe this is really i'm still doing this and i'm still getting to play and and uh uh also too i i uh as you get more uh as you play more you kind of find your boundaries a little more and you and you got to always keep stretching a little bit here stretching a little there and trying new things you know like like for uh i was around in my neighborhood uh, I grew up, you know, uh, playing uh, high school parties in the Pasadena and San Marino area. And, you know, I'm 16, 17 years old. And I was in this band called from San Gabriel called Blowout. And it was one of my first bands. And Blowout used to do shows with Van Halen. Uh, we used to play in Pasadena backyard high school parties. Uh, and there was this band called Van Halen. And uh, <laughs> back then, and, uh, back then, uh, there the vans were the rage, like vans, they used to put like mag wheels on vans, and they used to drive around. And they were like the rage from that era. Sure. And so there was these cars, cars, uh, or in van clubs or car clubs for vans. And, and there was a club, a club called Van Addicts van addicts right and and uh and they always had the biggest ass parties like hundreds of kids would show up and they had this band that was always playing for their parties they're called van halen and i always thought man this is this is kind of i thought at first i thought how corny is that you're change your name to van halen yeah. to be able to get the van parties that was my thinking of course and then and then, you know, until I went and actually saw them play and then they, oh my God, you know, they were incredible. And they were already the band. They were the, the Van, Van Halen that you were going to see later, but they were doing all covers at the time. I, I think they might've done one original song at that time. But one of the things from that era is, is that Eddie was already playing uh, tap, uh, tap guitar. He was already doing the tap technique which nobody was doing at that time. Yeah. You know, you know, you, well, you know, that's what Eddie's famous for. He was the first to make it popular doing that. So, and so I saw him doing it at backyard parties and, and, and keep in mind, Eddie was, uh, I went to his 18th birthday party. He had a gig and, and I remember going, it was a gig and they were celebrating. It was his 18th birthday. And, and uh, so uh, I started taking my bass home and trying to, was it how trying is to doing? tap trying to tap and so i ended up 
getting the hang of it. And I started doing it. I started getting faster and faster and doing it. And I ended up uh, 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 transposing a Bach fugue to tap bass. Do, do, do. I, like I, I could probably play it for you one time, but, uh, but it was something I, I, I just learned and did myself. And so no, uh, when, when someone asked me who was the first bass player you ever saw doing tap bass, basically, I can only say it was me. Yeah. I never saw anyone do it before that. And I don't think any bass player had even seen it up to that time because only Eddie was the only guitar player doing it. So not even guitar players were doing it at that time. No. And, and so that just happens to be being in the right place at the right time. That's you know, crazy. In there watching that. And I ended up actually going on tours and doing that Bach Fugue. I got to perform it. Uh, sometimes on tours. Uh, a few years later, uh, um, uh, I got to open up a show doing that Bach view. But anyway, this is all coming from Pasadena and being around that 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 world. And and there were some great guitar players that came from that era and from that time. And Eddie was just happened to be one of them. That's amazing that you saw them at backyard parties. Though I mean, that's really. I saw them- I saw him at a bowling alley in Monrovia. I saw, I, I remember I took my cousin to see him at the Hacienda Heights Women's Club. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> oh, I saw, you know, Van Halen at the forum. Yeah, yeah. I saw him at the, at the Hacienda Heights Women's Club. It's kind of funny. What would prompt them to book Eddie Van Halen? What would prompt them to book Van Halen at the Hacienda Heights Women's well, Club? Well, the fact that that was they didn't they weren't doing much other gigs than that sort of gigs probably some promoter rented the 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 venue and and sold a bunch of tickets probably made a bunch of money because the place was packed that's wild john what are your just knee-jerk reaction top three musical experiences which is a very hard question i know that it's like asking your favorite kid i mean all the gigs with boingo with Oingo Boingo, uh, but there's one in particular. Uh, the Oingo Boingo gigs were just incredible. Nobody sat down from the first song to the last. Every show I ever played with them. And so, I mean, that's incredible. You don't need, we didn't even have to get the crowd going. They were already going from the moment we walked out. So every gig was a celebration, but there was one in particular uh, 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 we ended up going to uh, Brazil and a friend of mine was a surfer in Brazil and he, he remember, I remember him uh, uh, contacting me and telling me, man, you know, Boingo Boingo is popular in, in Brazil. He goes, you guys should come out there. And eventually we did. And I thought maybe we're going to play for a thousand people. We ended up playing for 50 or 60,000 people in a football stadium. In, in Rio de Janeiro, and we were the only band. They all came to see us. We had a record that was number one in, in Brazil for nine weeks, and we we had a song that was the, the theme song for the number one novella in, in uh, Brazil. So not only did the, the kids like us, the moms and the dads and the aunts and uncles all know who Oingo Boingo was. And, and leaving the stage as the, uh, the big song there was Stay, uh, the uh, the Boingo song "Stay" and and coming out on stage and then when we were leaving, they didn't stop singing. Sixty thousand people just singing the song "Stay" as we left and and I get ch- chills just even thinking about that. So that was a moment I'll never forget. Uh, That's beautiful, and, man. And um, God, I would say maybe you know, playing with Neil was amazing. That was a a, a gig of a lifetime. Um. Man, that that is a hard question. Especially when you start thinking about number three. <laughs> You're weeding through lots of little memories there, man. Oh, God, that's a tough one. I I remember uh, uh, I remember one we did. I did a gig with Mutator, and I love telling the story. We played in a uh, in a uh, an auditorium like a. It would have been like playing the Fillmore. It was like that size of a of a venue, a, a theater where they take all the, the the seats out, and we had this show called the the, the destruction of Los Angeles, and and we uh, as part of the uh, when people uh, were told 
sold tickets, the, everyone was instructed to bring a flashlight to the gig. So 15 or 1,200 people showed up with flashlights. And, uh, and we had, uh, and on stage, we had a, like a, an L.A., scene like if you were in the city and people just going their way and it was like a almost like a play and we're playing and people are like are like doing the 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 like their everyday life and then all of a sudden a big earthquake happens <sighs> rumbling <sighs> and and uh, at that moment with the rumbling <sighs> we turned the lights out completely pitch black and, and at that moment, that's when 1,200 people turn on their flashlights. Wow. So now we have 1,200 lights going in every direction inside this auditorium. And it was at that moment that we pummeled the audience with debris and trash that was hanging from the rafters that we wow. hung all over the, we had nets full of debris. And in the black, with only the flashlights, the people got got covered with debris and, and things falling on them inside this auditorium. That's why the they're probably freaking out. That, that's probably a lot of people freaking out. Yeah. That when I, I, I just remember the visual of that is incredible. Just, just phenomenal. Wow. That's really cool, man. That's like something you'd see in a, like Universal Studio as you go in, you know, in, in, into the movie Hurricane or something like that. Yeah. You see stuff. Wow, that's really cool. Um, low points. What were some of the low points or dark periods you've had to deal with and how did you get through them? Um, I would say the low points for me uh, uh, have happened pretty recently. One happened pretty recently and that was getting hit by a car on my bike uh, on the street and going to the hospital with a dislocated shoulder. And luckily knowing that, and luckily I was wearing a helmet, but the helmet cracked. So I did land on my head. So anyone who rides a bicycle, wear a helmet. Uh, it saved my life. And uh, I had a dislocated shoulder. I couldn't lift my arm for three months. So I didn't play for months at a time. And just, you know, there's that, that scary, just not knowing whether, man, am I going to be the same? You know, when months go by and you can't play, is this ever going to be the same? But eventually through physical therapy, and I did go to physical therapy, I was able to come back from that. Uh, so that was a big, a big one. Uh, and the same thing happened to me in the, in the early 90s, skiing. I dislocated my right shoulder skiing, and that, that was, uh, that hurt. And coming back from that was kind of scary. And uh, another thing on a personal note is I lost my parents uh, uh, 11 months apart. Oh, uh, they both died in the late 90s. And that was really hard. That was a very uh, uh, hard period of time to go through. Yeah, because I'm assuming your parent, your the the sentiments you have about your family came from your parents. Yeah, and they were just very loved and um, you know, the, uh, losing your parents is something I always feel any, any of my friends are losing their parents. I always have a little bit more, uh, 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 you know, feelings towards that in the fact, because I had to go through those feelings. Sure, man. Sorry. You know, about so, that. So sorry. Oh yeah. Uh, so, but you know, on the other side, you know, having a family and, and, and having kids and, and all the great gigs, I'm always, uh, uh, getting home. From a, from a tour is always something I was like, oh my God, I made it. Uh, I've left my house, I've left my driveway in a touring van in the Food for Feet punk days, pulling a trailer with all our gear. And we, I've left my driveway and come back home uh, from the tour, 16,000 mi more miles on the odometer. Wow. Yeah, 16,000 miles I've gone from the time I left my driveway till the time I got back. That's so... It's like it's back and three, forth across the country three times. Yeah, it's three. It's three thousand miles across the country. So you yeah. can imagine all the crisscrossing you're going to do before you get to sixteen and end up back in your driveway. Wow. So yeah, yeah that's pretty major. Yeah, and I and you know that is, but I you know I'm sure most of the people you've had on your show have, got, have done that. 
stuff and like so that. And that to me, I always call that I'm earning my stripes. You know, everyone yeah. has to earn their stripes. And yeah. you got to get out and do that. A lot of time it's new bands. You know, my friend said that that uh, when uh, the police played at Madame Wong, he said they showed up in a in a station wagon and they're just, you know, hauling out their gear, you know, all three, you know, in a station yeah, wagon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, tell me two or three best concerts you've seen. Ooh. Man. Well, I mean, I have to say, uh, I have to say uh, Led Zeppelin at the Forum with the Houses of the Holy Tour. Um, I really, really just, you know, I was such a Zeppelin guy in high school. And so I was 16 years old and that was just like, uh, you know, and I love telling kids now, yeah, I saw Zeppelin and <laughs> oh my God, you know. Um, uh, you know, as far as the visuals, uh, seeing, uh, um, seeing Roger Waters at the Coliseum visually and just the sound and the whole production and he did the wall okay uh, that was really incredible uh, uh i was just seeing that whole how he did all that the production incredible uh odd there's so many neil young shows you know, even seeing Neil in the uh, when he would come out and do acoustic shows at the Greek theater. Uh, memorable. Yeah, he's seen some great shows. Yeah. Is there anything you haven't done yet that you'd like to do musically? Musically? Yeah, man, you're like always pushing it. I feel like you probably have a list. <laughs> I, I, have, I have one big list, one big is uh, I always say one day uh, I would love to play with a beetle. Well, so still time. Play with a beetle, and there's two left, uh, two beetles left who are just amazing. And rest in peace, George and John. Uh, but uh, if yeah. how that might ever happen, I don't know. You never say never because you never know. Greg Bissonette. I have friends who have played. Yeah, Greg Bissonette, a friend who's played with. And I haven't. Uh, I just played a gig. The, in fact, uh, the the keyboard player that I played with. Um, I'm, uh, this is how things are interacting. But uh, uh, um, a keyboard player that played with Mike Panera, uh, he played with with uh, with uh, McCartney. Oh, okay. Yeah yeah well let's put it out there you never know yeah man uh, so that that would be one thing uh i want to uh, i i always tell myself one of the things that uh i i did uh during covid was uh i i never studied classical uh upright bass with a bow yeah and uh during covid i took it upon myself to buy a bow and learn how to play arco bass. How did it and, go? Uh, that's something I really, really love doing. I I just studied some videos. I never had a private lesson, but uh, I was instructed on what rosin to get, and I started. And now I recorded a few things already with the upright bass. So that's something that was new that kind of came out of nowhere. Um, and just keep writing great songs. Try to write great songs. That's a, a never ending quest and always trying to get better at whatever it is I'm doing. Be creative. Well, you have made a, like a, at least on me, a huge imprint of um, pushing, man. That's like an important part of your mindset of like to keep pushing boundaries. I think that's really very inspiring to be honest with you. Thank you, Craig. Uh, I, I, um, I always looked at music like food, whereas every culture has their own style of cooking and their own food, and and every culture has their own music, and and to me it would be really boring to if I just ate meat and potatoes every day or yeah. just spaghetti every day or just Mexican food every day, and so I've always I I have an appetite for food. I like to eat good food from different cultures. I'll always, I won't say I don't like anything until at least I've tried it. Sure. And after you've tried it, then you can say you don't like it. 
but I, I'm really, really open in that way. And I'm always been that way with music and don't say you don't like it till you try it, you know? And so, uh, and, and over the years that's paid off for me because I can jump in on a jazz gig or a, a Latin gig or a funk gig or a hard rock gig and playing metals. And, and so I, I enjoy playing everything. I'm, I, I'm purist wise. I'm more of a rocker. That's the thing that I feel playing rock bass and, and, and rock and roll has always been my thing, but I am not closed minded that I won't play country or I won't play folk or, or whatever. Yeah. Well, it was interesting when, when you gave me your three, your top three uh, concerts, they were all classic rock, you know, Roger Waters, Led Zeppelin and, and Neil. Yeah. Okay. That's very interesting. I, I mean, I, I, I saw Segovia. I saw oh. Segovia play at the, at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion in 1984 uh and that was a uh, uh really something i you know he's the the father of the guitar yeah and uh and he was already really old but that was one of those kind of things where i said man i can tell my grandkids i saw segovia yeah seeing him old is okay you know yeah it was okay <laughs> it, and he was amazing uh another unfair question favorite musicians you've enjoyed playing with Guys who brought the best out of you, maybe. Well, for sure, Danny Elfman and Steve Bartik and Johnny Batos, the Boingos, uh, would be top of my list. Um, uh, I, I, there's a a, a band that with uh, playing with Steve Stephen Perkins from Jane's Addiction and Banyan, and uh, I've done I did a gig with Stephen Perkins and Neil uh, Nels Klein. Uh, that with a uh, trumpeter, uh, 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 Willie Waldman and, uh, musically, I'll never forget that night. That was just an amazing, amazing experience playing with those guys that night. And, uh, uh, N Nels is a, such a brilliant guy, man. Incredible guy. Yeah. Yeah. I, and we kind of came up together. He had a band called block with his brother back in the day. Uh, and then he had the Nels. Yeah, that's singers. right. Cause he grew up out on the West Coast in San Fran. I thought he grew up. No. Yeah. Well, I mean, I already knew of him when okay. he was in the early, early, early eighties, he was already playing around LA I and mean, he, he was already had a reputation for being a great guitar player and his success, you know, uh, is more of his commercial success. Didn't really come until later for him. Yeah. With, with, with Wilco pretty this, much. More, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. he was more avant-garde, a little bit more. He still artsy. is all his solo oh, yeah, projects. Yeah, uh, very much. Uh, early on, uh, uh, and, and so playing with him was a really great experience. Some the food for feet shows. I can't tell you how many amazing shows we had that were just incredible. Um, so yeah, there there's some. Uh, one one other show that was, and this is just a show. Um, this was right around uh, the mid 2000s. Uh, I got asked to play a jam gig up in, in the Bay Area. And, um, and it turns it was in this park. And it turned it, it was opening for Dr. John and, and, and uh, James Brown. Wow. And, yeah. And so we'd come up and I remember that day uh, uh, um, there was like maybe two or three bands that day that played. I had a uh, I brought my camera with me. I had this analog camera. I brought like eight rolls of film and I had this telephoto lens and, and real analog camera. And I said to myself, man, I'm going to get to see James Brown. I was super excited about seeing James Brown. And so we, while we played our show, I had an all access pass because I was on the bill. So I remember being in the audience and getting, you know, the pass got me more places. I couldn't get up on stage, but I was able to get up pretty close and I got some incredible photos. I took hundreds of photos of James Brown uh, that night or that day it was actually in the daytime it was in a in a park in the afternoon and instead of thousands of people there was like hundreds of people uh it wasn't like that big of a show apparently there was another show in town that uh uh 
kind of drew a lot more people, maybe younger acts or something. And so a lot of people went to this other festival thing. And so the James Brown gig was good. It was packed, but they said it would have been way more packed if it wasn't for this other gig. It was still awesome though. Yeah. And so James Brown looked amazing. The band sounded amazing. And I remember the band, I remember when he was finishing, uh, the band's still playing. All right. Thank you, James Brown. Thank you very much. And James Brown waving to the crowd and he, he starts walking off the stage. The band's still funking out and they didn't stop playing. Dun, dun, dun. So James Brown steps off into a, a pass van and, and he gets in this van. The band never stopped playing right from the stage. And they had like a, like a pathway for the van blocked off for him to drive away. And so he gets into this van and the band's still playing and he slowly starts and everyone in the audience runs to the side of the, 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 the road where he's, he's driving away. So there's like a quarter mile of people all waving to James Brown as he slowly drove by. And I remember seeing him inside waving to the people. It was like the Pope leaving, you know? That's great. And, and so there goes James Brown. And we're like, oh, my God, the band's still playing. It was like, wow, that was awesome. Oh, my God, you know? That's really and cool. I didn't come out. I didn't find out until months later that that was the last show James Brown ever played. And it was the last time James Brown ever left the stage. And I got to witness that. That's cool as hell. Wow. That's awesome. And I, and I got to document it with a bunch of photos. And and yet again, one of those kind of... And I didn't find this out till months later that when James Brown died, that and, and I remember my wife looking, what was the last show we ever played? And it turned oh my God, that's a show I played with them. You know, it was like, what? You know, that's amazing. So really how cool. Crazy how your journey, and I always call this my journey, how my journey takes me to these places where I end up with different people. It's pretty amazing. It is very amazing. Uh, do you have a worst gig ever story? <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> worst gig ever. The, there's two that come to mind. All righty. Uh, right off the bat. One was uh, Oingo Boingo. Uh, we, uh, it, we, this would have been around 1990. Uh, we took out, we rarely had opening bands play with us. But in this one little four or five gig run, uh, uh, we took out the Chili Peppers. Oh, okay. And 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 good, this good fit musically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Of course, they're amazing. And and it was right around the blood, sex, magic. What's their big record? Yeah, blood, uh, sugar, sex, magic. Yeah. So it was right when that record was just starting to hit. So they were just starting to take off, and um, and we played Red Rocks and we played Bear Mountain in in, in New York. Park City. Oh, uh, no, okay. Bear Mountain in Park City, Utah, okay. which is where, you know, the earlier story where I met the mutator. Yes. Okay. And so we're playing there and we're playing in the ski resort. And what they did is like when you come down the ski, this bottom area is where they would set the stage and the audience would be right here where the ski, where the people would come down. So the night we played, the Chili Peppers went on and, and they played a great show. And, and when we came on, this dust storm, this, this windstorm started blowing from directly to us from the front of the stage. And the people are dancing and, and it's all dirt. So all that dust is, oh. is just getting blown right into our faces. So literally halfway through the show, I'm running off the side of the stage and blowing mud out of my nose. And uh, it was just a horrendous trying to sing and play, and it was getting in your eyes, and as, and all that dust is getting in my eyes. It was getting so hard to see. Well, one of my eyes got infected, and it blew up to the size of a of a lemon. I got this huge, like it looked like somebody wow. hit me in the in the face with a baseball bat, and that's how I left the stage with my my eye all infected, and it hurt. And it was just miserable. It was what, you know, we still put on a great show, but that was one gig that was like, oh. Did it destroy your amps? 
No, well, yeah, I guess it did. Yeah, it, that it had was definitely to not good for for equipment. Yeah, I remember when I got home, I did have to wash all my stuff. But that was typical when we did mutator gigs. We did a lot of outdoor gigs. We even played at at, at Burning Man a couple of times. And those Burning Mans, I mean, your yeah. equipment gets everything gets destroyed mm-hmm. there, you know. And and uh, I had another gig in mind. Uh, Oh, there was one other gig where we were in a, uh, I was on tour with Al Chicano and I'm not even going to say what country it was in, but uh, <laughs> one day uh, a, a uh, uh, we were sound checking and this, these two military people came up to the, to the stage while we were sound checking, got out of their military Jeep, went up and asked everybody for their, for their passports and we were like, yeah, you know, okay, yeah, okay, all cool. Well, the manager of the band and uh, and uh, uh, the guitar player uh, well, were taken away uh, and 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 sent to like Singapore or something. So that that was one thing. The <laughs> other thing was uh, on one of the other gigs around that time, we uh, uh, we were. Uh, um, we had a gig in, I forget what city it was, but our you know, instruments didn't make it through customs. And so here comes, you know, time for sound check and we had no instruments. And then show time came, we had no instruments. And uh, uh, and all of a sudden we get a knock on the door and there was these military looking guys telling us that, hey, if you guys don't get out on stage, we can't guarantee you're gonna get out of here alive. And, and this, is, we were, this is with El Chicano. Mm-hmm. And uh, eventually, the promoter was able to get a hold of a of a, uh, uh, a music store, and he was able to get some instruments down. And we ended up going up on stage late, but at least we went up and we were able to play the show. But that was one scary show. Why the people were going nuts there? The what people was were kind of booing for the first couple of songs because we went on like an hour late. Oh, and, and it was scary. It was touch and go. But we eventually ended up winning them over. And uh, but man, when that knock, it was like, oh my God, are we gonna get out of here? Holy smokes. So those wow. are I mean, those are some scary gigs that can happen. Wow. Uh tuition. Everybody pays tuition, and I was wondering if you might be kind enough to share one or two mistakes that you made along your journey and the lessons you learned from them. Um, the, this has only happened a very small handful of times. The worst thing that for me is showing up to a gig and not being prepared. And to me, that is the biggest nightmare. And everything I do is to try to not ever let that happen. And either sometimes there might've been a, there could have been a misunderstanding. I got the wrong set list. And I showed up to the gig not learning the right songs or something happened like that. Or I, I've been in the studio for 15 hours a day and I booked this gig when I shouldn't have because I didn't have enough time to, to really go over the material as much as I could have. And I thought, oh, I'll get through this. And then you show up to the gig and it's just horrible because you're not where you think you should be. Yeah. So those are things I always regret. And, and I, anytime I have to learn material, I always think of those times when I showed up not prepared and um, so I always try to never let that happen. I always tell my students, when you get a gig, you got to make it so that whoever's hiring you will never, ever think about ever wanting to hire another bass player or yeah. another guitar player. You got to be the guy and, and you got to make that gig yours. And whatever it takes to do that, you know, be prepared to bring stuff to the table. And it's also to how, you know, show up. And that you fit the vibe of the band, the way you're dressed or whatever it might be, you know, all those kind of things, because you are putting on a show, people are paying money to see you play, give them, give them something they'll never forget. That's a quote from uh, Lucas Nelson that I always love to uh, recite, but he always would say that, you know, yeah, you always want to give the people something they'll never forget. And I, I love that saying. That's the number one answer to that question. Being unprepared for a gig, number one across the board. Yeah, Gibbs, um, you'll never forget. Yeah, I like that. Tell me something, John, that you want that you don't have now. 
could be something tangible or it could be a state of mind or a change you want to adopt or something you, the way you look at something? Man, um, uh, man, that's a, that's a hard question. I mean, you always like for me i always wish for health and happiness for all my loved ones my family and my friends and and just for generally for people for good people and, and that that work hard and 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 so for me it's i just try to keep doing what i'm doing and it doesn't feel that much different than it did 20, 30, 40 years ago. I really don't. Uh, maybe I'm a little bit slower at jumping, uh, jumping over amplifiers or, or <laughs> at first into the audience. Uh, but uh, I still try to put on a show. I still try to sweat my ass off. And uh, I love learning new songs and, and learning new techniques. And I love when musicians or bands make me work hard to play the song they want me to play. And so I, I love a challenge. And, and uh, um, so those kind of things. And um, just trying to always try to be a better musician, a better artist, try to think of things that are a little bit outside of the norm. Another tough question. What do you like most about yourself? <laughs> uh uh, I, um, I like, I mean, the th I think the fact that I've been able to sustain this thing that I've kept going from that first gig, uh, is something that I'm very proud of. You know, it's not about like uh, one thing I never aspired to do was to own a mansion in Bel Air in the top. The, I, I, that to me was a little too much pressure on me <laughs> just like to go for that. And although that would have been nice, I still have my, I have my, my, I call this studio Brando's paradise. Yeah. Uh, and, and so to me, this is like my place and, and I like being here. And so I'm proud of the fact that I've been able to sustain this. Yeah. And, and I'm very proud of the fact that people still call me to come out and play with them. Yeah. That to me is like, oh my God, people still want me to play with them. And it's not older players my age. It's a lot of younger players mm. call me to come play with them. And I'm very proud of that. And, and a lot of that is from the, from uh, staying is from, uh, came from teaching. And like I said, being in the pulse of the younger art, uh, younger players and musicians, and some of those younger musicians have gone on to have amazing careers. And I've been able to be proud of watching that grow, but then they're playing with great people and they get me on, on great gigs. So how uh, that all intertwined. Tell the story you told me, uh, I think earlier today or yesterday about the, the student you had that you then produced her records and she got signed to Sony. Yeah, uh, one of my uh, uh, former students, her name's Mayu Wakisaka, who uh, uh, has grown into an incredible musician, songwriter, just amazing songwriter. And she was my student at, at Los Angeles. Uh, it was called La, uh, LA Music Academy back then. And um, she asked me to be her, her, uh, her private teacher for um and but she was in the vocal department so i said you know i'm not a vocal teacher you know i i give i produce uh vocalists but i'm not one to to physically you know uh, how you hold your open your mouth and do all that i'm not that technical and i said uh do, you know why do you want me to do that she goes well i just want you to critique my songs and I said, she goes, yeah, why would the lesson be where I come to your house or, or we get together wherever and, and, you, and let me play songs for you, critique them. So I said, I could do that. Okay. So we did that one hour a week for 10 weeks straight. And she played me her songs. And like I said, she's a gifted songwriter. So, I mean, there was some amazing material I was working with. And at the end of the 10 weeks, at one point, she'd asked me if I would produce her. And I said, well, you know, I have a thing where I'm either your producer or I'm your teacher. I don't want to be both. So I said, whenever you graduate, 
hit me up and we'll we'll uh we'll talk about that so she ended up graduating and uh and she goes i want to i want you to produce the songs we worked on during the the private lessons so we put a band together mostly of, of fellow students and we and uh we we end up recording i think 10 songs and uh uh and what does she do? She goes out, she got a record deal with that record. It came out on Sony. And this record ended up, uh, she got licensing deals for chocolate companies, for um, uh, TV shows where they were using the song for theme songs. And she was the theme song for a chocolate company. So a lot of really cool stuff came out of this. Well, she went on to become one of the top uh, and still is one of the top songwriters for J-pop and K-pop. And wow. at one point, at one point a few years back, she had the number one and the number two most popular songs in the world. And Gangnam she wrote, Style? She didn't write Gangnam Yeah, she didn't write that one, but she wrote <laughs> songs that are really big with the kids, you know, with the sure. uh, with the K-pop. And, you know, those bands are selling out Dodger Stadium, you know, mm -hmm. and and I remember one night, one day we were, and so she came back last year and we're finishing another uh, record with her. That's also going to be coming out on Sony. And we've tracked a few more songs. And, uh, and, and while we were here recording, she takes me, we went out to lunch. And while we we're sitting there in, in, in uh, listening, uh, uh, we're sit, having lunch, songs came up on the, on the radio or on the playing that she had written. And there was, I live in a, there's a lot of, really, we were eating in our Asian restaurant. And in this restaurant, we can, there was like two or three songs that came on while we were there. That's amazing. That she had written. Yeah, that's really cool. Or Feather in a, your cap, man. That's. Yeah. Really cool. So she's had a great, great career and still doing it. So yeah, that's, it's really cool to see where that, where they end up. What's her name? Maya Wasaki? Mayu, Mayu Wakisaka. Mayu Wakisaka. Uh, you said something a couple of minutes ago I thought was really smart. I just want to ask you where that came from. You said, uh, I never wanted a mansion in Hollywood Hills because that was too much pressure for me. How did you know? You're right. But how did you know that at the time? Because you usually don't learn that lesson ahead of time. You usually learn it afterwards. Like, what the fuck? This is ridiculous. I, I guess maybe because I, uh, you know, I grew up, in, in, uh, you know, I had a healthy family, you know, I lived in a nice house, you know, my house, uh, middle class, my dad was a painting contractor, but I didn't grow up in no mansion, but man, my dad built a swimming pool and we used to take us on vacations. So I, I had a, a very uh, nice childhood and a very fun time when I was a kid playing baseball and all that kind of stuff. Right. And, and, uh, and, I don't know why I thought of that, to be honest. I just thought, uh, I just, from the very beginning, to me, to, to be able to pay my rent and buy the gas for my car playing gigs with the money bought from playing gigs, uh, to me, was a, was a, that was a victory every time I did it. And sometimes it was crazy. We had to do things to make it to the next month. Uh, I remember one time uh, I, I was... Uh, 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 it was the very first time I ever played Vegas and, and uh, 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 I, me and my roommates were about to be uh, evicted from our house because we couldn't make rent. And we're three musicians. We had no money. And somebody uh, uh, came up with this idea. There was an audition at the Las Vegas Hilton for a two week engagement. And they're having an audition on Monday, the week before. And we thought if we can go down there and get that gig, we're going to be able to pay the rent for our hotel or for our, our house. So we put together this idea of putting together a completely Vegasy, like a schmaltzy show with and dress over the top with the outfits and the medallions. And, and we learned the songs that we knew were going to be the, the songs that would go well in this Las Vegas Hilton lounge. And so we, we went there, we borrowed some outfits and went there and we got the gig. And so we had to go back home and we were like, okay, we got this gig. We go back to Vegas and we ended up playing the Las Vegas Hilton. 
and it was a two week engagement. And during the first week, Liberace came in with it, with, with his little entourage of people. Yeah. And he comes in and got a booth and he's sitting there and he's watching the show. And you're like, Oh my God, Liberace came to see our show. And, and, uh, and then the, the next week he came in again with another entourage of people where we finally went up to, Hey, Liberace, thank you so much. We called them libraries. We <laughs> how to pronounce his name, but oh no, it's Liberace, libraries. not libraries. That's awesome. Oh my and, God. And, that's and, and, uh, that and might be the funniest thing you said this Mr. whole interview. Liberace, and he was a sweet guy. He was, Hey man, you guys are great. Good luck to you. You're, you know, that's to nice. somebody like a legend like that was, was a thrill. And we went home and we paid our rent and we didn't get kicked out. That's all. That's a good story. But how I think, but the thing that you said was it was too much pressure for me. Uh, God, I wish they taught that in school or something. Because who the hell needs that pressure? Yeah, I mean, it's life's it, tough enough. Life is tough enough. And, and there's nothing wrong with 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 dreaming of, of reaching the stars, you know, and I don't want to take anything away from that because I, of course. Me, I, got, I got there, you know, and, and I've got, you know, uh, but for me, like, I, I, it wasn't like I wanted to, to be a gazillionaire. Yeah. I wanted to make a living do, playing music. That was, to me, was my victory, whatever that was. And, and I've had some good success in production and, and touring. And so I, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm happy with where I got. It wasn't sure. like, oh my God, I didn't end up like Madonna. No, you exceeded your expectations. Yeah. But I think yeah. it's so healthy that I'm, that is such a healthy thing, what you said, because it, it, it's an undue and unnecessary amount of pressure. And what it does is it prevents you from enjoying the journey on a daily basis. You know, uh, I watched, you mentioned Roger Waters, uh, there was, uh, I don't know if you saw the DVD or the, on Netflix, maybe the making of dark side of the moon. Mm. And Roger said something in there. I saw this about 15 years ago, maybe. And it really impacted me. He says, you know, most people go through life and they can't wait till this happens and they go on vacation or they can't wait till this happens. And then they get to go buy the mansion. And he goes, the problem is life starts at dot and it goes you don't get any do overs and you don't get to erase. It's not like a studio. You edit one part out. And when you have what you said, when you have these things in your head, like I want to do this before this happens, you're missing all this time where you're working to get that. And um, what you just told me is that you've lived every day. You know, you've been very, you've done a really good job or appears to have done a good job being present. Yeah, and I think also too that's very well said. And also, I think um, when it, sometimes making decisions based on trying to make enough money to make it up here, as opposed to making musical decisions or, or style things based on being an artist, right? As opposed to doing it for for the art of it, not for the money of it. Correct. And I think that's going to cause you to be even more original and it's the original people that really make it big yeah the that they're doing something new that have never been done before they're the ones who are going to make it to the big multi-million dollar estates and whatever yeah and so i think it's good to just be true to yourself and follow your heart and whatever that is and and making like i said making decisions based on on art as opposed to based on oh this is going to sell the most well, and it also goes hand in hand with what you said of it's too much pre pressure you got when you're just doing something because, hey, I like this. What What's the pressure? Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like it's the joy, which is far more important than money in the end, you know, and on a daily basis. And when you go home to your wife or your husband or whoever the hell you're going home to, you know, that's where your life is happening, man. So I, that was really good. I, I really applaud you for having that foresight. Uh, any hobbies? outside of music baseball i love baseball and i love uh dodgers los angeles dodgers i've always loved baseball ever since i was a kid and my dad used to take me to dodger stadium when it first opened in 1962 and i was oh, just a cool. kid and i've been going there ever since and um uh, one really good story is uh 
the Dodgers have uh, their famous and uh, announcer Vince Scully. Sure. It was like a household name in, you know, in baseball announcing. Well, the counterpart of the Spanish broadcaster is, is uh, Jaime Harin. Jaime Harin is like the Vince Scully of the Spanish radio. Yeah, which makes total sense because you have so many Hispanics. It's in, oh, yeah, that's, yeah, you, you got to have. Actually, probably 10 times more people listen to Jaime Harin because all of Latin America listens to, to right. Jaime Harin. And the Dodgers are an iconic team. They're like the Yankees, you know? Yes. And, and Jaime, is uh, he's in the Baseball Hall of Fame, and he's... Um, you know, he's an icon. He, he's a, he has a star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame. I mean, he's an icon. Yeah. And, and one morning around 1984, 85, I got woken up at eight o'clock in the morning and the phone rings and hello, John Avila. This is Jaime Harin. Um, <laughs> I'm half asleep, right? I'm just yeah. waking up asleep. I'm trying to think who could this be? The first right. person I thought of was the guitar player in my band, Tovar. I said, Tovar, it's eight o'clock in the morning. I can't believe it. It's silence. No, John, this is Jaime Harim. Like, oh my God, it, man, that, it does kind of sound like him. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. I was like, hi, uh, uh, Mr. Harim, <laughs> what can I do for you? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and it turns out it really was Jaime Harin calling me out of the blue. He got his number because it's a small world. His, his son, Jaime Harin Jr., was friends with my wife's sister. Okay. And, and there was a connection there. And it turns out that Jaime was a big Oingo Boingo fan. Oh, my God. And, and so he asked his dad. He got my number through my wife's sister. And he asked his dad to call me to see if, if if he can talk he could talk to me about getting the you know oingo boingo tickets once they went on sale they would sell it like that and he couldn't get tickets so Jaime calls me and asked me if, if he can get a pair of tickets for his son and with and he said I will be for forever grateful and if you ever want boingo see or if you ever want Dodger tickets here's my he gave me his phone number his own phone number and and so of course, I mean, I'll get you some, I'll get you some pair of tickets. Just have them go to will call and da, 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 you know? Right. And so about, uh, so about two years later, uh, no, I take that back about a month later, I go, man, I should take them up on that. So I yeah. called Jaime and Jaime, dude, how come it took you so long to call me? I thought you would call me the next day for tickets. Well, you know, I, I didn't want to be a bug, you know, and, oh, no when do you want to go well can you get me four tickets for my wife and two for my for myself and and then uh i'd like to bring my parents and so i got to bring my parents and and, and my wife so the four of us went we sat in the in the uh what do you call it the press box area that is like, awesome like two rows so we sat there and uh and we uh, and he he comes out and watches like two innings of the game with us that's amazing so cool so, so he's the nicest guy and and we're sitting with us you know talking and and so he brought me a baseball with uh uh from that was signed by the whole team oh, and, man. and oh i take it back the year was 1988 and that was the year they won the world series up until last year wow so i got a baseball with the whole world series championship team from 1988 signed how sweet is that? And man? of course, I brought a T-shirt from Boingo and gave it to him. And and anyway, we ended up become, becoming friends. He, we ended up hanging out a couple other times after that. That's we so out nice. San Diego, and he was a dear, a sweet guy. That is so cool. So that's like Latin royalty, basically. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. for sure, man. Absolutely. That's a very yeah. cool story, man. Yeah, and you especially never know. you being a baseball We're, fan. Yeah. It was a thrill. And then I got to experience, you know, Fernando mania. That's that right. And, and as far as like the other things I like to do, I've always been very um, into doing stuff that are physical. Yeah. Uh, yeah like for years I was a, a runner and, and uh, I used to run like, you know, miles and miles every day. At one point, some, I would run like six, seven miles a day uh, before a Boingo tour. 
<laughs> to get in shape for that. And other things I like doing is cycling. I got hit by a car, I mentioned earlier, but uh, uh, up until that time, uh, cycling, and I just started riding again a little bit more. How's your shoulder? Uh, how's your shoulder? Bro? It's good. I'm 110. percent That's cool. Cool. But I yeah. like uh, climbing hills, going up hills on mountains, things like that. So those kind of things are are things I really like doing. It's funny, man. I just talked to some other guys. I guess that must be in, like a popular thing uh, in LA. Uh, you have to know Keith Nelson mm. from. Um, uh, Buck Cherry and then uh, Scotty Hill from um, God, I'm having a brain fart. This is what happens when you have so many people. Um, <sighs> Quicksand Jesus, what who, uh -huh. who uh, with Sebastian Box, man, this is terrible, okay. embarrassing. He Scotty Hill does a lot of bike riding. I see these guys post on Instagram, they're, oh, yeah, they're going up and down hills all the time. Yeah, what well, me and the guitar player, singer of Gama Sen, and him and I ride. Yeah, it's, it's our little thing we do outside of the band. We just like we go. He lives near the ocean, near uh, Playa del Rey, and we do a twenty-five mile ride right on the boardwalk. That's down, beautiful, we, man. Fifteen miles down the coast, and then we turn around and come back. And we do that. We were doing it once or twice a week for a minute, but we're going to get back into it. Good man, that's it's good for you. Skid Row, that's the band. Sorry, I had a brain for that. Skid Row, oh yeah. Uh, John, tell me about a specific experience that changed your life or altered the way you think about things? Um, the experience uh, uh, I told about my first bass, getting it out of the attic, that was definitely a, a, a life-changing thing that happened. And also the experience of going to Starbucks and meeting yeah. these kids, and because that started my teaching career that, my that is phenomenal and because it started only because of that i, yeah. I would have never done and i would have never met these amazing young people that i work with if it wasn't for that trip to to starbucks or play with neil oh yeah it ended <laughs> up, it, i ended up with neil getting to play with neil because of that and uh um so those are two big things um uh Man, that's a hard one. I can't think of anything right off the bat, but if I do, I'll, I'll jump in. You know, things that I life altering things. Um, you know, I I would say making smart decisions about my health and well being. Uh, for me, that was really a big thing. I was a lot heavier 10, 12 years ago. Wow, and, that's hard. Uh, to a lot heavier. I was like you know, 40 pounds heavier for a little guy like me. That's a lot. Yeah, yeah. And I had high cholesterol and my, my health was not where it should be. I was out of shape and I got a very high cholesterol reading. And my doctor said, man, you got to do something because your, your cholesterol is really high. You need to bring it down and you need to start eating better. And, uh, uh, uh one day a book was mailed to me out of the, out of the blue and the book was called Eat to Live by uh, Dr. Furman. And uh, the book came from uh, 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 Anthony, the drummer from uh, Promise of the Real. It came from his mom. His That's mom funny. sent me the book. And I, I was like, I remember like it was so random. And I, I called Anthony. I go, hey, your mom sent me this book. And he goes, yeah, she thinks you should read the book. And I was wow. like, it was like, okay. That's like a little and, angel coming in your life. And man. I read yeah. the book and it changed my life. I immediately start. I did everything the book said to do. I gave it a shot. I go, I'm going to try this. And my cholesterol went in a three or four month period without any medication. My cholesterol went from 306 Holy to, shit. One, to 170. That's amazing, man. And this That's, was all from starting to eat proper and to extra start exercising. And I lost 40 pounds. It took me about a year, but I lost about 40 pounds in about a year. Good for you. That's awesome, man. And so that, that was a life-changing decision I made that wow. was for the better. And yeah. That's it's fantastic. really paid off. And I still live that way, you know, yeah. just trying to live cleaner and and 
those kind of things, you know, it, wow. if, you know, if you want to be around a little longer, you definitely yeah. have to, you have to the, make And things. if you want the quality of your life while yeah. you're around, that's almost yeah. more important in a way, you know, yeah. you want to like not be, you want to enjoy whatever time you have left. Yeah. You know, most people I, are like just waiting to die, you know? Absolutely. I have grandkids now. I have a three-year-old and an 11-year-old. So I want to see them, yeah. I want to see them grow into adulthood. Hell yeah, and, man. And, and, uh, you know, that, those kind of things. So uh, whatever you got to do to make that happen. Well, congratulations. That's a real good decision, man. A uh, couple of questions left and that's it. And man, I just want to say thank you so much for everything. I see why Joby was so excited for me to connect with you, uh, man. You have so many good stories and your vibe is so cool, you, man. Joby. And so uh, genuine and, and your enthusiasm for everything you've done is really cool. It's very nice to, you thank know, you. To, to feel that. Um, Biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years, John. And <laughs> was how, that? Was how much that? Was that? Yeah. Was that and and uh and part of that whole thing of where, well, since I'm doing this exercise thing and I'm eating better, uh 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 drinking alcohol was something that I also said, you know what? I let me not drink beer. I used to like beers and whatever, and I said, I'm just gonna stop drinking alcohol. And that was something I did at that time that I've carried on to this day. Wow. So you don't, you don't drink at all now. I don't drink alcohol. And, and, uh, it's something I gave it a shot and I really enjoy it. I like waking up and feeling good. Good for you, uh, man. That's all. So that's that awesome. Was, Dude, you're like, uh, you could, you have a lot of plan B's you could do, you know, 90 days to fitness with John. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh... <laughs> yeah. I, I could, you could have this whole, like, you know, <laughs> series of, you know, your life story. And, you know, I, I vis I'm, I'm seeing this here, man. I, I got plenty more stories where those came from. We'll wait for volume two. Yes, man. I'm totally down for that. And uh, I want to tell people where to find you, but any final words of wisdom? Follow your heart. Just do what you do and just be true to yourself and, and, uh, and just play hard, play hard and be creative and and make noise don't be afraid to make mistakes that is super important mistakes, you're not gonna get better thank you man and for those us. are all things that are really good and and uh and be safe out there thank you man uh let me tell people where to find you and what you got going on uh okay so first of all if you are interested in uh connecting with john from a production standpoint, um, you can reach him on Facebook at, uh, is this John Avila or John Avila? Music? Yeah, John Avila. Okay. Uh, find him at John Avila, A-V-I-L-A, and uh, just send him a link to your band and, you know, why do you think he's going to be a fit and what you're looking for so he can come up with an intelligent response for you. Uh, also, he is an instructor at the L.A. College of Music. If uh, I know he is a big fan and, a you know, he's given his heart and soul to that place. And if you're interested in working with him there, that's uh, always open. Uh, Oingo Boingo and Danny Elfman and all the great music he made. You can check that out. He's currently got a few different projects going on. Number one, he is in a band with Vinny Apice or Vinny Apice. No, it's Vinny Apice. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because he told me that Karma, they all pronounce it differently. Uh, Vinny Apice, uh, the band is called Black. The album coming out soon is called Black Sun, S-U-N, Trine, T-R-I-N-E. And they have their first show coming up. Where can people find out information on that or see uh, it just, online? There's a, it's on Facebook, Black okay. Sun Trine. Great. And there's there's a lot of stuff being written uh, right now. They're doing artwork and, and getting ready to put that record out. It's a 10 song LP and Vinny is just killing it on the drums. And uh, John Hoffman, lead vocal guitar player. Uh, and it's like trio. It's like trio uh, metal. Met metal. OK, awesome. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to mess up the names of the Ga the, ga the Gamma Senin is yeah, another project. Yeah, the Gamma Senin. The Gamma and, Senin. Talk about and, that. That is a project that I played bass on, uh, and uh, we're going to be doing some shows. Uh, we're playing Las Vegas uh, for a uh, festival there, and we're going to be in. Uh, you can go there. You can find them on Facebook, and uh, we have a, a, a warm up show in Los Angeles at the Re uh, Redwood Barn Grill uh, in September. 
and uh, we're are, we're getting into that. That's going to be a really cool, fun project. What kind of music? It's rock. It's kind of more. It's kind of more, kind of stony, psychedelic kind of rock. Very. That's groovy, awesome. Really fun stuff to play. I use a lot of bass pedals, so there's a lot of whammy and wildness. Actually, in all these bands, a lot of all fun. Right. Stuff. fun and it's Gamma Senin. G A Gamma Senin. Yeah. G A M A N N. Yeah. G A M A N N S E N N I N. And this time he is not playing for rent money in Las Vegas. No. Uh, And of uh, course, there's Oingo Boingo former members. Go ahead. Talk about it. Now, Oingo Boingo former members is the band minus uh, Danny Elfman. And uh, we've been playing together for over 15 years. Uh, and we, we have this, uh, Brendan McCrary, uh, uh, on, on, uh, 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 on vocals, incredible singer. Uh, um, and so that band is playing a bunch of shows around Southern California, uh, the Canyon clubs. Uh, we, uh, we'll be playing in Vegas. We have shows in San Diego all through October. So if you go to Oingo Boingo, former members, uh, uh website you can find all the dates there for that great fantastic and all at least a dozen shows and furiosa with uh jonah nimoy who's jonah nimoy, yeah. yeah and that's a band i've been playing with for a number of years we play around hollywood and we've we've done the troubadour a few times and uh through the pandemic we've been re- doing some recording uh, and uh, passing files along through each other. But we have some incredible songs come out. Also very rocking, metally, like, ah, it's so much fun. Lots of energy. And that's F-U-R-I-O-S-A. And also, yeah. very cool, the Avila Band with uh, Avila. John. Yeah, go ahead, talk, talk, talk about that. John Avila, yours truly. Uh, Sam Avila, my brother Sam, who is currently on tour with Los Lobos, he plays Hammond, Oregon. He left this morning for a one-week tour with Lobos. Uh, Andy Avila is a drummer and one of the main lead vocalists. Uh, he is the drummer for Andy Frasco in the UN, who toured the country. You could find Andy Frasco playing all over. They just headlined uh, Red Rocks also. There's Danny Avila, guitar player, also amazing bass player, uh, who tours with many people. And my daughter, Lila Avila, who is the, the one who uh, the one with the voice. Yeah, the one with the voice who was responsible for me going to Starbucks. She's responsible for your pension. You got to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for your teacher's so, pension. <laughs> yeah. So the Avila band, we have a record coming out. We just finished. an. Uh, uh, it's like about seven or eight songs that we're going to be releasing some songs, all original music. Very cool. And people find that again on, on social media. Yeah. Or, okay. Yeah. Great. The Avila band has, uh, you can find us on Instagram. Great. Fantastic. And uh, John's website will be out soon. So just keep an eye out for it. It's John Avila, A-V-I-L-A.com. And yes. uh, man, is there anything else that I forgot or that you want to mention the diet program 2022? Yeah. Uh, what else? All right. And John's got another band, Jackie O. Talk yes, Jackie O. Jackie O is uh, with the guitar player from Oingo Boingo, uh, uh, Steve Bartek and uh, Ira Ingber on guitar and David Raven. And uh, we have some recordings out there that you know we play a lot of shows around LA and uh, really fun band. We're doing some original music. We have a, uh, um, a video uh, that we're putting out for a song I, com- I composed, uh, Why Me? It's an old Food for Feet song that we're putting out as a video. So really cool, fun stuff. You should check that out. Jackie. And people can find that on social media? Uh, or on- yeah, social okay. media. There's Jackie O. J-A-C-K-I-E? Yeah, and then O. Jackie O, okay. And put Jackie O band because you're going to get John Kennedy's ex-wife or his wife who comes up. All right, man. That sounds great. Man, uh, uh, just look. I'm going to be out there rocking because I'm not stopping now. I'm going to keep on rocking. Don't don't you dare, man. I love seeing smiling faces out there because that's one thing during this COVID that I really missed. Yeah. Most of all was all the smiling faces of playing for people that were there to be entertained and just have a good time like we were. And 
So just happy to be out there again. So come on out. Absolutely. And congratulations again on 39 years of marriage. That's awesome. Oh, uh, thank, thank, thank you so much for everything. Thank I mean it. Thank great. you so much, man, for all your time and for being so cool. Um, let me just wrap this up and then I'll, you and I'll chat for a minute. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, share it around with your friends. Thanks very much to John Avila for everything. Again, the Gamma Senin, uh, Black Sun Trine, JohnAvila.com. L.A. College of Music, Oingo Boingo, former members, Furiosa, and the Avila Band, and the uh, weight loss program in 2022. Uh, <laughs> thanks for everything. Most important, don't forget that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice, go play your guitar or your bass, and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I am out. John, thank you so much for everything, brother. You're the best. Thank you, Craig. Thanks.